Hello fans and welcome to This Day in Baseball where we're going to bring you a full radio broadcast of today's game and before we do that I just want to thank Classic Baseball Radio and there's a link in the notes where you can uh, check out their full channel. They have many, many great radio broadcasts. And while you're listening to today's game, if you want to check out much more about the game and the players, look on the links below, and you're going to see uh, links to player pages, the date the game happened, the year it happened, and the play-by-play. Enjoy the game, and check out the links while you're watching the game, and please don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that every time new content comes out, you're going to get that uh, firsthand. And thank you again for checking out This Day in Baseball, and enjoy the game. Good afternoon, baseball fans. This is Jim Simpson, along with Tony Kubek. Welcome to Bush Memorial Stadium in St. Louis in the 1966 All-Star Baseball Game. Brought to you by Chrysler Corporation, makers of Plymouth, Dodge, Chrysler, Imperial, and Dodge trucks. By Gillette, the people who know men best. By Winston Builder Cigarettes. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. And by the Brewers of Falstaff Beer, the choicest product of the Brewers' art. Well, this is a brand new stadium here in St. Louis, and this is the site of the 1966 All-Star Baseball game. And no matter who wins or loses, it will be certain that it will be said it was a hot, hot day. Yesterday, the temperature reached 105 degrees. The temperature today already well above 100. We've tried to reach the Weather Bureau, and the line is busy. But they expect temperatures in St. Louis today between 105 and 108 degrees. Already, power has gone off in the city in some section just today. It's expected to go off today, and they're running a little short of water. So no matter what happens on the all-star field today between the American and National League, everybody will remember this one as the hot one in St. Louis in 1966. This broadcast is authorized under broadcast rights granted by the Commissioner of Baseball solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. And any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Well, on this sunny afternoon, working with us again, as he does all year long, is the former Yankee shortstop, Tony Kubek. And, Tony, the 1966 All-Star Game is just moments away. Right, Jim. Thank you very much. And here, quickly, are, is a rundown of the starting lineups for the American League, leading off of the Detroit Tigers at shortstop, Dick McCollum. In center field, also from the Detroit Ball Club, Al Kaline in center field. In left field of the Baltimore Orioles, Frank Robinson. In right field, Tony Oliva of the Minnesota Twins. Brooks Robinson batting fifth and playing third base also of the Baltimore Orioles. And the rookie, George Scott, at first base from the Boston Red Sox. Catching for the American League is Bill Freehan of the Detroit Tigers. At second base, batting eighth, Bobby Knopf of the California Angels. And pitching from, from the Detroit Tigers, Dennis McLean. For the National League, leading off, well, Willie Mays in center field of the San Francisco Giants. In right field, Roberto Clemente, the Pittsburgh Pirates. In left field, Henry Aaron of the Atlanta Braves, batting third. At first base, Willie McCovey, San Francisco Giants. At third base, Ron Santo of the Chicago Cubs, batting fifth. The catcher, Joe Torre of the Atlanta Braves, batting sixth. At second base, a replacement for the injured Joe Morgan from the Houston Ball Club, Jim Lefevre, a switch hitter of the Los Angeles Dodgers, batting seventh at second base. From the Cincinnati Redlegs, Leo Cardenas at shortstop, batting eighth. And the pitcher... We all know him, Sandy Koufax of the Los Angeles Dodgers. All right, Tony, and in a moment, Stan Musial, who has participated in 24 All-Star games, will introduce this year's All-Star squads. The prospect of two fine pennant races this year is causing the turnstiles at Major League Baseball parks to swing at a record rate. Latest figures show attendance in both the National and American Leagues is running well ahead of last year. With an all-time high of 22.5 million paying fans established a new high for the Major Leagues. Through July the 4th, both leagues showed attendance gains of about 20%. So they're headed for another record total game. 
One more word here on this hot, hot afternoon about the heat. The umpires are lined up this way. Al Barlick of the National League is behind home plate. At first base, Frank Umont of the American League. At second base, Ed Vargo of the National League. At third base, Jim Honocek of the American League. In right field down the line, Bob Engel of the National League. In left field down the line, Jerry Newdecker of the American League. But because of the heat, at the end of five, they will switch. Al Barlick will go from behind the plate to third base. Jim Honocek will come from third in behind home plate. Ed Vargo will go from second to first. And Frank Umont will go from first to second. That is in deference to the heat. Being escorted to the mound now is Miss Jane Morgan, along with Stan the Man Musial. And, of course, it is Mr. Musial of St. Louis, even now vice president of the Cardinal Ball Club, that is getting the big hand. And Stan will introduce the entire squads before Miss Jane Morgan will come onto the field to sing the national anthem. The three-day flight of the Man Gemini 10 is scheduled Monday, July the 18th for full and comprehensive coverage of this, the most complex mission, followed on NBC Radio and Television starting at 4 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time, Monday, July the 18th. Down to our left, in their road uniforms, the All-Star Squad of the American League making its way out to the third base line. And now Stan Musio calls the National Leaguers out. And they'll be coming from the first base dugout. And, of course, being a National League park, you will hear perhaps a greater amount of applause for them. The National League has won 14 of the last 19 All-Star games. They have won seven of the last eight. And when they won last year, six to five, that put them ahead of the American League, 18 games to 17 with one tie. The National League has finally overtaken the American League. And Sam Mealy, the manager of the American League, is set here in St. Louis. He will go with everyone, except, of course, his pitchers. And by law, he cannot more than three innings that it takes to win. He is not going to substitute for the sake of getting men into the ball game. He'll go with what he considers to be his best lineup. Earlier today, Tony Kubek talked with manager Hank Bauer. And, of course, manager Hank Bauer manages the Baltimore Orioles, who are now eight games on top in the American League. And this is what Tony and Hank talked about. Hank, you presently have an eight-game lead over the rest of the American League, and people are calling you a push-button manager. How does that make you feel? Well, I don't know what they mean by push-button manager, Tony. I never played for one of them fellas, you know. He just looked at you and said, hey, you go play. And uh, that's uh, just about what I've been doing. I, uh, I uh, put uh, F. Robinson number three and B. Robinson number four, and if there's a right-hand pitcher, I put Powell fifth. I put Aparicio leading off, and then I fill in the rest of it. And uh, so far, we've been very fortunate with my good pen. Henry, they said that uh, your pitching would not be strong enough down through the year, and I know you're getting some good years from people like Steve Barber, who was at the All-Star game today. Good relief uh, work from the bullpen. Is your pitching going to last the rest of the year? Well, Tony, we've got it set up where we, we think it, uh, we've got uh, good pitching. And it's, uh, for one reason, I go uh, six or seven innings with my starter, and uh, if they're good, then I go to Sue Miller and Eddie Fisher, and uh, I know a lot of people... Uh, say that I go to the bullpen uh, pretty quick, and uh, I think I've got a reason to when I got Stu Miller and Eddie Fisher sitting out there. Hank, talking about Eddie Fisher, this looks like the type of trade the Yankees used to make in the middle of the year when they seemed like they needed a player, and all of a sudden they could come up with something. Do you have this kind of thinking in mind when you got Eddie Fisher? Uh, well, first of all, Tony, we, uh, we were looking for a starter, and uh, actually, uh, when, uh, when we went looking for a starter, they wanted uh, probably half of my ball club, and I knew uh, that the White Sox was looking for a second baseman. And Adair had uh, a wonderful two years with Baltimore while I was there, and we brought this kid up, Davey Johnson, who's done a good job. So uh, we had uh, pretty good value in Adair, and uh, the White Sox were looking for a second baseman, and uh, they were willing to part with Fisher because, from what I've heard, uh, Stanky didn't want two knuckleballers in the bullpen. He had Wilhelm and Fisher, and uh, he traded Fisher. Hank, talking about a Yankee-type trade with the Eddie Fisher Adair trade, uh, let me ask you this. What's happening to the Yankees? You played for them in their successful years, as I did, and now you're playing against them, managing against them. What is the difference in this ball club? Well, I, I think uh, all year, Tony, they've had pretty good pitch, and I think it's just lack of consistent hitting. Uh, Mantle got hot there for a while, and they were winning, but 
It's just uh, it's not the old Yankee way they play. It used to be one guy cool off, the other one pick him up, but they don't have that type of ball club no more. And I think this is the reason why Baltimore's been a little successful, is that maybe Frank or Brooks goes into a rut and Powell hits, and we've always got one guy in the lineup that's pretty hot. Hank, you're talking about the power of the Yankees in the past and the power of the Baltimore Orioles presently with Bauer, Brooks, Robinson, Bleffrey, with Powell, rather, uh, the Robinson boys. Let me ask you this. What about the inner defense? I know this is so important. How about the apparitions, the people that don't get the credit due to them? And, of course, uh, second baseman, Brooks Robinson at third base. How about the defense? Well, Tony, I think uh, uh, little Louie uh, today is having one of his best years, I'd say, in the last five or six years. He's, he's playing real good shortstop. He's hitting about 250. Uh, he's getting on base for guys like Frank and Brooks. And uh, as, he, as I said, he's having a good year. Davey Johnson, to me, is going to be one of the best second baseman in baseball. Uh, right at the present, I think he's got a lot to learn. He's got good speed. He's got a lot of range. But uh, as I said, he's inexperienced, and I think we'll make a real good uh, second baseman. Now you're talking about defense. I've got a little center fielder that, uh, well, he doesn't hit him very much, but uh, he can catch anything that goes up in the air, and that's Paul Blair. And I think you need defense to win these baseball games also. Hank, let's talk a little bit about today's game. In fact, let's project a little bit farther than that with your eight game. Lee, let's talk about next year's all-star game a little bit. You may be the manager in that ball game. I hope you're right, Tony. Uh, I don't know too much about these all-star games. I played in three and I coached in one, but uh, I think a ball game like this is up for grabs for anybody. Uh, uh, everybody thinks that the, the National League is so much superior to the American League, and I disagree, I disagree with them for one reason, Tony. They play with a round bat and a round ball in both leagues. Hank Bauer, thank you so much. Continued success the rest of the year, and we hope to see you next year in the All-Star Game managing this ball club. Thank you very much, Tony. In St. Louis, the starting lineups are now being given. We'll run down them again for you in just a moment. But right now, we'll be back with more pregame color on the 1966 All-Star Baseball Game right after this message from Plymouth. races all over the country. Winner of the Daytona 500, the Rockingham 500, the Atlanta 500, Plymouth, winner of the Darlington 400, the Yankee 300 at Indianapolis, and the grueling Charlotte 600. Of course, you can't buy these race cars at your Plymouth dealers. They are specially modified just for stock car racing. But the same engineering know-how that gives the racing Emmy such a record of performance and reliability goes into every Plymouth you can buy at your Plymouth dealers. Why with the winner? Plymouth, a great car by Chrysler Corporation. For the 1966 All-Star Game in St. Louis, this is Jim Simpson along with Tony Kubek. And introduced at home plate the honorary coaches today, Ted Williams for the American League and Casey Stengel for the National League. And Tony Kubek, we've been saying it all along. We will repeat it all afternoon. It is hot. You have played in temperatures such as this before. What can we look for as an effect on the players? Well, Jim, the people that most worry about this heat, of course, are the pitchers and the catchers. But as we know, the pitcher, the starting pitcher, is not allowed, according to all-star rules, to go more than three innings. The only time a pitcher might go more than three innings is in the event of an extra inning ball game. The catchers also worry considerably about this heat. And I talked to Joe Torrey and... Bill Freehand, the starting catchers for the National American Leagues, and they're kind of hoping that managers Walt Alston and Sam Mealy leave some of the late-inning catching chores for some of those catchers that they took along. But Sam Mealy's plan up till this time is to go along with his starting eight regulars and go as long as he can. He wants desperately to win this and even up this all-star competition. All right, Tony, let us now set the defense for you. The National League, of course, is the home team here at a brand new and beautiful stadium in St. Louis. At first base will be Willie McCovey of San Francisco. Down at second base, Jim Lefevre of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And by the way, Joe Morgan was selected as the starting second baseman, but was hit on the knee in batting practice by a batted ball. 
and could not play. However, we noticed in the all-star introductions by Stan Musial, Joe Morgan was here in civilian clothes and was introduced. But Lefebvre of the Dodgers is at second. Leo Cardenas of the Cincinnati Reds is at shortstop. Ron Stanto, who was actually hit in the face by a pitched ball and suffered a fractured cheekbone some weeks ago, has recovered and is hitting well and is at third base. In left field, Hank Aaron. In center field, Willie Mays. In right field, Roberto Clemente. Behind the plate, Joe Torrey. And the pitcher, of course, is Sandy Koufax. Now, Koufax has made three appearances for the National League, but has only worked a total of three innings in his all-star career. He's won one ball game and lost none. And, Tony, I don't believe there are too many that did not know what Sandy Koufax throws, but for those who don't, a rundown on Sandy Koufax. Jim Sandy Koufax basically is a fastball, curveball pitcher, but it goes much further than that. He's got an overabundance of speed on his fastball. His curveball just keeps breaking in. A hitter it just doesn't have the time to ever catch up to it. So you'll see guys swinging at his curveball in the dirt, and that fastball, it'll be up in their eyes with that extra speed and that rising type fastball. All right, Tony, we'll run down the batting lineup for the American League, which will be first up here in just a moment. But now we pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is WGY, WGFM, Schenectady. It's year-end closeout time at Schenectady Plymouth. Stop in and save today at Schenectady Plymouth, your quality award-winning dealer at 1016 State Street in downtown Schenectady. The National League team has not yet taken the field. Here is the American League lineup as the National Leaguers warm up along the sidelines, leading off and playing shortstop Dick McCullough from Detroit. Hitting 283. Batting second, also from Detroit, in center field, Al Kaline, hitting 325 with 21 home runs and quite a streak before this All Star game. Batting third, in his seventh All Star game, the first in the American League, is Frank Robinson playing left field, hitting 312. In answer to some questions, yes, other players have played on All Star squads for both leagues, including Jim Bunning, who is in this ball club and this ball game, now in the National League. Batting cleanup, he's won the batting title in the American League the last two years in a row from Minnesota. Tony Oliva hitting 314 now. Batting fifth, a former most valuable player, Brooks Robinson of the Baltimore Orioles, hitting 295, and he's got 70 RBIs. Batting sixth, he was at Pittsfield of the Eastern League last year, George Scott at first base from the Boston Red Sox, hitting 271. Batting seventh, Bill Freehand of Detroit. Batting eighth, the catcher, or rather the second baseman, Bobby Knopf of California, and the pitcher will be Danny McLean, batting ninth from Detroit. And now down to our right, the Vice President of the United States, his coat off on this hot afternoon, will throw out the first ball. Right now, Mr. Humphrey is simply making some motions as if to throw on behalf of the press. And now the National League squad takes the field. Behind the plate will be Joe Torrey as Sandy Koufax walks slowly across the mound. And Tony, again, a rundown. How long can the pitchers play and how long can the players play according to all-star rules? According to all-star rules, as I mentioned before, Jim, the starting pitcher can go only three innings. A pitcher, the only time he can go over three innings is if the ball game goes into extra innings. As far as the starting regulars for both teams, the teams that were voted in by the players of the American and National Leagues, they must play a minimum of three innings, and as I mentioned, Sam Mealy plans to play his nine, or his starting eight, for the entire nine innings. Of course, with this heat, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, talked to Tim McCarver, and Sunday, they played a ball game here, the St. Louis Cardinals did, and it was 116 degrees on the field. I have nothing to say. That is hot. Sandy Koufax making his warm-ups now, and Dick McCullough. 13 home runs, 35 RBIs, 11 doubles, and 7 triples. Steps around to the left-handed side of the plate, watching Koufax throw a curveball before stepping in. The first two men up will be wearing the gray of the Detroit Tigers, Dick McAuliffe and Al Kalon. Strange as it may seem, with the top batting averages of the National Leaguers and their high RBIs, the American Leaguers have not been out-muscled, out-slugged by much. It is very close in total runs scored and in total home runs. The National League is the slight favorite in this ball game. Koufax is ready, wipes his brow, McAuliffe steps in. The shortstop hitting 283 on the season. And now the 1966 All-Star Baseball game from St. Louis is underway as Sandy Koufax gets the sign. The wind-up. First pitch is hit high in the air. Maybe a play on it. Off third base comes Ron Santo, waving away Joe Troy, the catcher, and there's one down. The 
Pollock battles to Sando, and here is Al Kaline, 325 hitter with those 21 home runs, and this is his 12th All-Star game. Right out of high school, into the major leagues, at a veteran All-Star performance. Kalen, of course, in recent weeks has been very hot with the bat, Jim, and uh, in one streak he had 11 home runs and 14 ball games. So he's one of the hottest hitters. Well, of course, you can't say he's one of the hottest hitters. They're all hot. They have to be to make this type of team. Strike one, Koufax took a little off that pitch and caught Kalen at the knees. Now, remember, we have a National League umpire, Al Bonick, behind the plate for the first five innings, and Jim Harnachik, an American League umpire, will be behind the plate for the last four. The U and R, the crowd, as Kaline swings and misses, it's strike two. You can see we mentioned earlier about Koufax's rising fastball. Well, Kaline, right that time, swung at a pitch that was up in his eyes. Koufax, fastball when he's right, takes off. This one has popped high in the air. It may make the stands, but overcomes Willie McCovey, giving chase and has it right at the stands. Two down. Koufax has two of them on foul outs. That will bring up Frank Robinson. National Leaguers have known him for some time. For the American League, this is his first season. He's burning it up, hitting 312, 21 home runs, 56 RBIs, 19 doubles, 5 stolen bases. And the Baltimore Orioles are 8 games on top in the American League race. And to show you how hot it is, we're keeping score here. When we go to pick up the pens, they slide and slip. It's difficult to hold on to them. Koufax throws. Robinson hits it high, but not too deep. Hank Aaron is back nearing the warning track and has it for the third out. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. The score at the end of the first half of the first inning, the American League nothing, the National League nothing. Winston tastes good. Like your cigarette should. Make your cigarette Winston. When I change to Winston, I change for good cause. I got the taste I can do I would. Winston tastes good like it should. When you change to Winston, you change for good. Make your cigarette Winston. This is Tony Kubek along with Jim Simpson coming from you coming to you from St. Louis New Ballpark Memorial Stadium and to give you a brief rundown on this ballpark it's completely encircled the dimensions down the both lines are 330 feet dead center field is 414 feet the power slots right and left center field 386 feet the playing surface is very hard it's been sunbaked for the last past few weeks the ball goes through the infield very quickly the ball does carry very, fairly well in this ballpark all right, stepping in for the National League, Tony, in the bottom of the first with no score is Willie Mays, leading off and playing center field. And for those of you who may say, hey, wait a minute, why is he leading off? Walt Alston said, I did it in 1960. He got four hits, and I want as much speed as I can at the top of the batting order. So Willie Mays will lead it off, 277 on the year, facing Denny McLean, the Detroit right-hander, making his first all-star appearance. And Denny took something off his curveball on that one, a slow curve, and Mays was out in front of it, strike one. McLean has never appeared in an All-Star game before. He's only 22. His father-in-law is Lou Boudreau, who today is seeing McLean pitch in the majors for the first time. He's here in St. Louis. McLean throws fastball this time, catching the outside corner, and it is quickly strike two to Mays. Sandy Koufax retired the side in the top of this inning on five pitches. And the number one hitters for both of these teams didn't waste any time. McAuliffe, of course, popped the ball up, and Mays had a vicious cut at a slow curve ball from Dennis McLean. McLean throws inside with the fastball this time. It is one and two. And that is the first ball thrown by either pitcher that is missed being in the strike zone. Mays will be followed by Roberto Clemente of Pittsburgh and Hank Aaron of Atlanta. One-two pitch for McLean. He got him looking on the outside corner. Looked like a hard slider, but Mays is out. 
It'll be interesting to see if uh, McLean pitches the same type of pattern he has in the games we've seen him previously this year. It takes him a few innings before he really gains his control. He's a hard thrower, has a good fastball, and Charlie Dressen taught him a slow curveball, and this makes his fastball that much more effective. Here is Roberto Clemente of Pittsburgh, 328 on the year, 13 home runs, 56 RBIs. This is Roberto's seventh game. He has won the batting championship a couple of times here in the National League. We are in the bottom of the first. There's no score in this 1966 All-Star Baseball game. One down in the bottom of the inning. McLean's pitch is a fastball right down the middle. Clemente taking all the way. It's strike one. The infield is playing McLean about straight away. McAuliffe, the shortstop, is playing him up the middle. And Knopp, the second baseman for the American League, shading him slightly toward right field. In into center field, Al Kaline stops, now starts in, and is there and has it for the second out. That will bring up Hank Aaron, hitting 289, 26 home runs, and 67 RBIs. His 11th All-Star game. The defense, George Schott, is down at first from Boston. Bobby Knopp of California is at second. Dick McAuliffe of Detroit is at short. Brooks Robinson of Baltimore is at third. Frank Robinson of Baltimore is at left field. Al Kalon of Detroit in center. Tony Oliva of Minnesota is over in right. Bill Freehan, your catcher from Detroit. And McLean from Detroit, the pitcher. Two down, bottom of the first, no score. McLean's first pitch, curveball. Same first pitch he gave to Willie Mays. Over, strike one. You talk about setting defenses, Jim. The most difficult thing in All-Star or World Series play is setting up a defense and a pattern of pitching. There's a strike slider on the outside corner to Aaron. The most difficult thing when you haven't seen a player all year long is to establish a pitching pattern for your pitcher so that you can play your infield strategically. Play them where that hitter, that good hitter, is going to hit the ball most often. This becomes difficult when you see these players so, so uh, infrequently. The two-strike pitch bounces in the dirt alongside of the plate. Bill Freehand drops off to his right and keeps the ball in play. For those of you who may have just joined us, may we again remind you that the temperature today is expected to reach 108 degrees. One and two the count to Aaron. Two down, bottom of the first, no score. Another curveball. This one hangs high, and it's 2-2 to Aaron. Willie McCovey is on deck. Vice President of the United States is here. The entertainer Jane Morgan sang the national anthem, and we have a packed house of more than 50,000. 2-2 pitch, and he's called out on strikes. Second strikeout for McLean is off to a good start, as both pitches are. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And the score at the end of the first inning is the American League nothing and the National League nothing. That's Bugles and Drums, and you'll hear that each evening Monday through Friday at 5.45 on WGY when I bring you Spotlight on Sports, the only full 15-minute radio program in the area devoted exclusively to sports news of the day. This is Bill Carpenter inviting you to hear Sports Spotlight each day and to tune in Mondays and Thursdays at 5 minutes past 7 p.m. for two new programs of auto racing news, Northeast Racing Roundup on Mondays and Speedway Highlights on Thursdays. And these programs are only part of WGY's extensive and intensive coverage of sports. Monday through Friday at 6.15, horse racing fans will like Howard Tupper's track talk. Golf enthusiasts will enjoy Bill Edwardson's golf talk on Thursdays at 6.35 p.m. with questions from golfers and answers from pros. All this plus Mets baseball and national sports coverage from NBC on WGY, your reliable station for sports in 26 counties of New York and New England. Said it's expected to get up to 108. We move now to the top of the second inning. Tony Oliva of Minnesota, Brooks Robinson of Baltimore, and George Scott of Boston to face Sandy Koufax, who threw just five pitches in the first inning. Koufax's first start in all-star play, believe it or not. Oliva is a left-handed batter. He has won the last two American League batting championships. Facing Koufax takes strike on the outside, and of course, Tony faced Sandy Koufax in the World Series last October. Both Tonys, this one and the one hitting right now. <laughs> How did and you make out? Neither one of us fared too well, as most hitters don't. Swing and a miss by Oliva, and it is strike two. And Koufax has thrown nothing but strikes. We're in the top of the second. There's no score and none down. Bertie Tebbets is coaching 
at third and Hank Bauer at first. Took something off that pitch. It's up high and it's one and two to Tony Oliva. In the first inning, McAuliffe hit the first pitch and fouled to Santo at third. Al Kaline fouled out to McCovey just near the right field stands and then Frank Robinson lifted the lazy fly to left. And in five pitches, Koufax had the American League down. Here's Oliva. One and two the count. Waits. Hits this one straight up in the air. And again, McCovey may have the chance as he comes over the first baseline. And it hits on a rail in back of a television camera. And bounces almost back out to the mound where Koufax, who has already gotten a new ball from Al Bardic, picks it up and throws it out of play. Count is one and two to Oliva. As Jim mentioned earlier... Ted Williams is one of the honorary coaches along with Casey Stengel, and Ted Williams, as he most often does, spent all of his time in batting practice behind the batting cage, and he made comments on every hitter and almost every pitch for the press, for the radio and sports announcers, and he feels this is a real good background. He said he'd love to get up there and hit in this ballpark. Hi from Kovacs. It's 2-2, and Tony, you'll have to say that the radio and press are still in awe of the splendid splinter, Ted Williams, because they were talking to Ted as much as they were to any of the top all-stars who are still in the midst of their careers. Kofax taking his time in this 100-degree heat. 2-2 is the count to Oliva. First man up in the second. There's no score. And he hits this one high and foul. Back comes Torrey near the screen, but it bounces two rows in. And the count remains 2-2. The official temperature reading at game time is 100 degrees at the airport here in St. Louis. Down on the playing field with the absence of any wind whatsoever, I would guess, Jim, it's probably more like 108. And you'll get no argument at all out of me. Would you believe 107? (laughs) I'll take the 8. 2-2 is the count. Oliva hangs in there. 314 on the year with 49 RBIs, 17 home runs, a lot of power. And a good man with his wrist. He can control that bat. Takes up high. And now Koufax has gone all the way with Oliva. It is three and two. We mentioned Tony Oliva facing Koufax in last year's World Series. And I had a chance to talk to him about Koufax's curveball. Many pitchers have good curveballs, as does Dennis McClain. But Koufax's curveball just keeps breaking. And you think you've got it as a hitter, and it disappears. Line drive to center field. Willie Mays started back and now takes it with that patented basket catch. Shoulder high and there's one down. Oliva lines to Mays and that will bring up Brooks Robinson. Brooks again at third base for the American Leaguers with 70 RBIs on the year. 295 is batting average, 17 home runs. A most valuable player in the American League and with one down and no score in the top of the second, Robinson faces Koufax and takes high. Brooks, of course, bats from the right side. Oliva was a left-hander. Both teams are predominantly right-handed hitting. The only switch hitters on the National League squad. Koufax waits. High, a change-up, got way away from him and brought a new from the crowd as Torrey had to straighten up and reach up for the pitch. It's ball two. That's one of the rare off-speed pitches you'll see Koufax throw. He's basically, as we mentioned, fastball, hard curve ball. He took something off this pitch. There's a line drive to left field coming in quickly as Aaron, and it gets by him as he tries for the shoestring catch. Rolling to the wall. Robinson is around first, around second. He'll go for third. Here's the throw from Aaron into third to the cutoff man. And it is a three-base hit for Brooks Robinson. Aaron tried for the shoestring catch. The ball tipped his glove. It would have been a great catch had he made it, but the ball went all the way through and rolled to the wall. And Robinson is on third with a triple. And that will bring up George Scott. The first baseman from Boston who just a year ago, Tony, was in the Eastern League playing for Pittsfield. And here he is in the All-Star game with a chance to drive in the first run of the ball game. And in just three short months, Jim, he has already... He already has the American League pitchers in awe. They talk about the ball he hit in Yankee Stadium, the ball he hit in the Baltimore ballpark. He can hit him a long way. Koufax gives him the fastball, but it's up high, ball one. Brooks Robinson is at third with the potential first run of this ball game. There's no score. We're in the top of the second. One man out. Oliva lined to Mays to lead off the inning. 
Shot a right-handed batter, takes inside and low from Koufax. Was not changed up on him yet, and it's 2-0. and The National League infield has moved to about the halfway depth. The shortstop, Cardenas, and the second baseman, Lefevre, are about halfway. Santo, the third baseman, McCovey, are playing a little bit closer into the hitter. They're going to try and cut the run down at the plate. The back throws, and Scott swings and misses on the fastball. It's 2-1. and one. That one was about shoulder high. And Mr. Scott took a real rip at it. 18 home runs, 54 RBIs, 6 triples, and 13 doubles for his 271 average. High and inside, and it's 3-1. and one. And Koufax, who got the side on five pitches, has thrown a bundle here in the second inning. He went all the way with Oliva, who kept fouling the ball off before lining out. Robinson has tripled, and now Scott has worked the count to 3-1. and one. The Dodgers left-hander has the sign and throws, and strike two. Scott was swinging on the 3-1 and one pitch and took a good cut, but missed it, and it's 3-2. and two. On deck is Bill Freehand, the Detroit catcher. As Tony said, in this heat, it's the catchers who will really suffer. Ground ball at the plate, bouncing back and over the screen. Actually hit by the plate and then hopped up and went over the screen, the backstop. Still 3-2. Hank Bauer, the first base coach, yelled in to Scott to try and cut down his swing off Colfax. Scott, of course, is a hard swinger. He has that long home run type swing. And Bauer walked halfway up the line and alerted him to the fact that Colfax does throw hard, as everyone well knows. And... He's trying to get him to punch that ball and hit it somewhere to score this run. Here's a 3-2 pitch from Koufax. It's straight up in the air. This one, McCovey will have a play on. In foul territory by the first big coach's box, and he's got it. And that's two down. And Koufax is almost out of trouble, if you can be in an all-star game. And you can see the American League hitters have been a little bit late on Koufax fastball. McCullough fouled out to the third baseman, K-line to the first baseman, and now Scott to the first baseman. They're a little bit late. Here's Bill Freehand, the Detroit catcher. Eight home runs, 30 RBIs, 248. His batting average in the regular American League season now with two down. And Brooks Robinson still perched at third base. No score. Top of the second inning. Bertie Tebbets walks over and says a few words to Robinson at third. Andy Koufax can work three innings. His first all-star start. Just then, Jim Lefevre shifted to his left on free hand. And there's a wild pitch. Gets over the head of Troy. Comes back, and Robinson scores. And the pitch actually was a breaking ball that did absolutely nothing. It was high and over Torrey's head, and Torrey leaped up into the air. The ball bounced off his glove, but he had no chance, and it scored as a wild pitch. Well, Sandy almost cut loose with one of those, you'll recall, Tony, a little while ago. It brought the ooze from the crowd. Another breaking pitch. It was way up high. And this time, Torrey, who is no small man, well over six feet, leaped up and leaped for the ball, and it went over his outstretched glove. Just ticked it. Rolled to the screen, and Robinson scored, and the American League is in front. one nothing. The count is one ball to freehand. It fouls this one to the screen, and it's one and one. On the triple by... Robinson. It appeared that Henry Aaron did not get a real good jump. The ball was hit well on the line. Aaron hesitated just somewhat, tried to come in and make a shoestring catch, and of course the ball got by him. I think, Jim, that with this shirt sleeve crowd, predominantly white shirts, the ball may be a little bit difficult to pick up off the bat for the defensive team. There's a line drive to right. Clemente's coming over and takes it on a basket catch for the third out. One run on one hit. No errors and none left. And at the end of an inning and a half, the score, the American League won, the National League, nothing. Say, have you ever been spoiled? I mean, really spoiled by something that's so good, you just can't go back to the way things were before. Well, if you have, you know what a great feeling it is. But if you haven't, you're going to get a chance to find out what it's like as early as tomorrow morning. You know how? By shaving with the Gillette Super Stainless Blade, also known as the Spoiler. The spoiler isn't just a new razor blade. It's a whole new standard of shaving. The Gillette Super Stainless has a miracle plastic coating baked onto the edge. A coating invented and patented by Gillette. When you shave with this new blade, you can actually feel how much less pool there is. And that's when you'll become spoiled. So completely spoiled that you'll never go back to your old way of shaving. No matter how much you liked it before. So after the game, why don't you go out and get yourself the spoiler. The Gillette Super Stainless Blade. You might as well get started getting spoiled right away.
St. Louis for the bottom of the second inning of the All-Star Game for 1966. The American League is on top. On a triple by Brooks Robinson that skipped by Hank Aaron and a wild pitch by Sandy Koufax. Danny McLean, here in the bottom of the second, will face Willie McCovey, Ron Santo, and Joe Torrey. And McLean got Mays and Aaron, two of the game's best hitters, looking on third strikes in the first inning. The third man, Clemente, flied to center. First pitch, McCovey made a move toward the ball, but it was outside. The scoreboard is yet to show a ball or a strike. We did not see Albalik go up with the right hand, so we'll call it outside. There's a foul back. There's strike one. That is up, but as yet, Tony, it only says strike one. Jim, this far, all we've talked about is Koufax, good fastball, good curve. Well, this fellow on the mound for the American League, Dennis McLean, also is one of the hardest throwers in baseball. Here's the pitch, and now that one is low, and the scoreboard is now up to snuff. It is two and one. On Willie McCovey, 296 on the year, 17 home runs, including a couple in a game against Cincinnati Saturday, carried by NBC Television, 49 RBIs. One run on one hit, no errors for the American League, 0-0-0 zero, zero, and zero for the National League, and this one is hit sky high in the air. Brooks Robinson, standing on the grass, has it for the first out. McCovey pops to Robinson at third. Here is Ron Santo. And when you start talking about intestinal fortitude, give a lot of credit to Mr. Sato, the Chicago Cubs. Fractured cheekbone in a long hitting streak, sent to the hospital, but back in a little more than a week with the Chicago Cubs, and he picked right up where he left off, hitting 311, 18 home runs, 40 RBIs. This is Ron's fourth game, the Cubs' third baseman. When Stan Musial introduced the National League All-Star team, the biggest hands went, of course, to the St. Louis favorites, McCarver and Kurt Flood of this ball club. A very close second was Ron Santo. Who lines the ball to Brooks Robinson at the left field line and back at third base, and they're two down. Mr. Robinson has done that all his life. He is quite a third baseman. No mistake about that. Right, Jimmy went almost into foul territory for that foul territory for that ball, backhanded it, made the play look easy as he always does. Here is Joe Torrey. The all-star catcher, 21 home runs, 53 RBIs, hitting 286. This is his fourth game, and Joe this year has also played a little first base, but he's been selected as the all-star catcher. Two down in the bottom of the second inning, as Torrey takes a strike on the inside corner around the knees from Denny McLean. The score, the American League one, the National League nothing. Rebellion girl. Does this time of year make you want to head out from the herd and go galloping off in exciting new directions? Well, come on. Dodge Charger is for you. Charger. America's first full-size fastback. With sleek styling outside. Man-size comfort inside. Standard, a big, powerful V8. Disappearing headlights, tachometer, and luxury interiors, too. Plus, fold down rear seats that give you luggage room by the wagon load. Dodge Charger. Looks like a high priced thoroughbred, but costs only a few dollars more than those pony sized cars comparably equipped. After all, why settle for a pony when a full sized Charger costs so little more? Load up. The Dodge Rebellion wants you. This is Jim Simpson along with Tony Kubek back in St. Louis where the American League leads at the end of two by the score of one to nothing. One run on one hit, no errors for the American League, no runs, no hits, no errors for the National League. And now we pause 30 seconds for station identification. This is WGY, WGFM, Schenectady.
It's happened, yes, through the spectacular efforts of every employee at Schenectady Plymouth. The outstanding Chrysler Corporation Quality Dealer Award is theirs for the fifth time. Only seven dealerships out of the entire region will receive this award this year. This proves that the trying harder people at Schenectady Plymouth are offering the best in quality selection, used car warranty, and service. Why not stop in and see for yourself? That's Schenectady Plymouth, 1016 State Street in Schenectady. Hit down to Santo, who charges at third, throws to McCovey at first, and there's one down. Now the man they call the Detroit Bulldog, Denny McLean. He's pitched 149 innings this year, 3.08 average, struck out 104, walked 59. He's had two one-hit ball games and two two-hit ball games, and right now he has the National League's hit list. He's retired six in a row. At bat with one down in the third, and he swings on the first pitch, strike one. McLean, in looking over the lineup, said before this game, there's nobody that worries me, not one person that is. They all do. This one he hits high in the air and will make the stands. And back to home plate on the right side. It's two strikes to McLean. Dick McAuliffe on deck. Kovac's ready with a two-strike pitch, and this one is up around his eyes, and McLean goes for it to strike out. And that is the first strikeout for Sandy Kovac. Two down, here is Dick McAuliffe, the left-handed hitting third baseman, a rather shortstop from Detroit, who fouled at the Santo at third to lead off the first inning. As a matter of fact, he hit the first pitch. Last year's ball game, I think many people will recall McAuliffe hit a home run for the American League. He had a strong first half of the season last year, as he is this year. This one is over McAuliffe's head, and he has to duck and back out of the box. Not a hard pitch from Koufax, but nevertheless right in the vicinity of Dick's head. It's ball one. It seems as though Koufax, as he did in last fall's World Series, is having difficulty controlling his breaking ball. The wild pitch was a curveball that got away from him, as is, was this one that went over McAuliffe's head. There's a strike. And we have just received information from the public address announcer that Jim Bunning is warming up to come in for the National League and Jim Cott for the American League. The pitchers now can only go through inning, three innings. It is one and one to count to McAuliffe with two down here in the third inning. This one is high and inside again. And Koufax again, when he takes something off the pitch, as Tony Kubek said, is having trouble getting it over the plate. Two and one to McAuliffe. This one is sliced foul and upstairs. 3.30 down each line, 4.14 to dead center, 3.86 in the alleys to right and left in this brand new and beautiful stadium here in St. Louis, which the Cardinals did not occupy until after the season actually began. Two out on the top of the third, one to nothing, the American League leads, 2-2 the count to McAuliffe as Koufax throws, a breaking ball that is fouled up into the air, Torrey's after it, Santo's after it, now Santo takes it for the third out. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. The score at the end of the first half of the third inning is the American League one, and the National League nothing. tastes good like your cigarette should make your cigarette Winston when I change to Winston I change for good cause I got good taste like I knew I would Winston tastes good like it should when you change to Winston you change for good Like your cigarette should make your cigarette Winston. Back in St. Louis, it is the bottom of the third inning. Jim Lefevre, Leo Cardenas, and obviously someone will bat for Sandy Koufax, who's now worked his three innings. Koufax gave up one earned run, one hit, and struck out one and walked no one. 
Lefevre at second base is Joe Morgan of the Houston Astros was injured after being selected to that position. Lefevre hitting 261 on the year from the Dodgers. McLean throws and Lefevre swings on the first pitch. Going back at shortstop is McCullough waving everybody away and now the left fielder Frank Robinson says I've got it and he takes it. One down. Leo Cardenas, the all-star shortstop from Cincinnati, hitting 260 in his third year as a member of the all-star squad. 36 RBIs this year, 11 home runs. One out in the bottom of the third, the American League on top, 1-0. Brooks Robinson tripled and came home on a Colfax wild pitch. McLean throws, strike, fastball. American League infield is playing Cardenas about straight away. The outfield is playing him pretty deep. For shortstop, of course, Cardenas does have some power for his size. Low with the fastball again, and it is one and one to Cardenas. Armin Franks of the San Francisco Giants is your coach at first, and Harry Walker of the Pittsburgh Pirates, your coach at third. Walter Austin is managing the National Leaguer, Sam Neely, the American Leaguers. McLean throws, and there's a ball lined at the Bobby Knopf. At second base, two down. Jim Bobby Knopf started running off the field, apparently thinking there were two outs. He'd carry the ball at second base, all to the pitcher's mound, and McCullough alerted him, and, uh, well, a handy here right there is Kurt Flood. Colfax is out after working his three innings, and Kurt Flood, and as Tony said, he gets a tremendous hand. He is a Cardinal, hitting 285 on the year, 45 RBIs, four home runs. He's stolen nine bases. McLean faces him and throws him a breaking pitch that's right over strike one. McLean is within one out of pitching three perfect innings in all-star play, and for 22 years old, now let's try to thrill. National League is whooping it up as a fastball from McLean catches the outside corner. It is strike two. The umpires will switch here at the end of five innings. It is our barley to the National League behind the plate at this moment. Bottom of the third, one nothing. American League leading, two down. Big curveball climbs high and doesn't come down or over. It is one and two to Kurt Flood. Kenny McLean is usually not a control pitcher, and yet Bill Freehan, the American League catcher, is sitting on that outside corner, and McLean is just threading the needle. One two pitch fastball, but it's too low and outside, and it's two two. On deck, the leadoff batter, Willie Mays. Tony, I'll never get used to Willie Mays leading off. But Walter Austin was successful with it in 1960 and is using it again here. 2-2 pitch now to Kurt Flood. Fastball again low. This time it is lower, and Flood has walked and worked his way to a 3-2 count. Two down in the Cardinal fans. If Kurt can be the first to reach base against Denny McLean, he will hear quite a hand. And I imagine Denny McLean would just as soon finish his three-inning stint right now without having the wondrous Willie come to the plate. Well, here's a 3-2 pitch, and it's lined right back to the center. But out picks it up, and back to second base, and throws him out as it was slowed up, I believe, by Denny McLean, the pitcher. It went right back through the mound, but Knopf threw him out. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And the score remains at the end of the third inning. The American League won, the National League nothing. Hi, this is Jerry Ducey. Let's take a look at a typical morning at your house. Dad has just left for work. the lady of the house is just about to settle down the youngest member of the tribe. <laughs> there it is all settled down now. Now you've just made very short work of all the breakfast dishes. Now you're all set to relax with music on the Jerry Ducey Show. I'm here every day at 810 on the dial from 1015 to 1130. I wish you'd listen in. It'll help keep a young fellow off the streets. That's me.
and we are seeing something happen here at the All-Star Game that I have never witnessed and probably most people have not. A few thousand people have gotten up because of the unbearable heat and are walking back into the shade under the stands. Well, I don't think they're on their way home, Tony, but nevertheless, as we said, it is a very hot day and they are certainly seeking shelter. Jim Bunning coming in now is 9-5 and five on the year from the Philadelphia Phillies with an unearned run average of 2.38. Repeat for you, the American League is out in front, one to nothing, and the totals thus far, one run, one hit, no errors for the American. The National Leaguers have failed a scratch against Denny McLean, who pitched three perfect innings. To lead off against Jim Bunning, here is Al Kaline, who fouled the McCovey at first, back in the first inning. Jim Bunning, like Frank Robinson, has been in the All-Star game for both leagues now. He's in the National League now. There's a curveball. It could have even been a hard slider, but nevertheless, it catches the inside corner to K-line, and it's strike one. The only hit of the ball game, a triple by Brooks Robinson that skipped past Hank Aaron in left field, and he scored on a wild pitch of Koufax, and that's it. Bunning ready and throws another breaking ball. This one is a big curve, and it's over for strike two. And Jim, of approximately 15,000 seats here at this Memorial Stadium in St. Louis, I think about half of those in the sun, or maybe a third, are vacant. They have been here, but in better than 100 degree temperature, they have left. Here's a ball hit straight up in the air into short right field. Clemente is coming in, going back as a second baseman, and it is Lefevre who takes it in fair territory just before crossing the foul line. Here is Frank Robinson, who flied to left. One down in the fourth inning. The All-Star game, and... Well, as it's been said, and we will continue to say it, because you will read about it tomorrow, and it is a fact. It is very hot in St. Louis. Have been well over 100 for a number of days. And they tell us there's no relief in sight. Whoops, curveball almost got away from Bunning. Way inside, Robinson turned a shoulder and avoided the pitch. It's ball one. And a sign on the board in center field reads, Jim Cott warming up for the American League. One and zero pitch from Bunning to Frank Robinson, high and inside with the fastball, and it's two and zero. The bullpens here in this ballpark are almost under the stands, and it is impossible to see from up here, as it is from most places in the ballpark, who is warming up. So they give you a flash on the scoreboard to let you know who is warming up. Do no count. Ball is lying deep, but I believe it will climb foul into the left field seats in the third deck. Foul ball. It's two and one. Jim, I'd like to have gotten a tape measure out for that one had the ball been fair. That ball carried well over 400 feet, probably close to 450. He hit it real well and just barely curved foul. Well, it's 330 down the foul line, but remember, this got into the upper deck. Two and one. One down, fourth inning, American League at bat. They lead one nothing. The 1966 All-Star game as Bunning throws. This one is on the fists of Robinson, and he fouls it off. It's 2-2. It's early in the ball game, but the only changes that have been made, the Kurt Flood batted for Sandy Koufax, and Jim Bunning has now relieved Koufax here in the fourth inning. And, of course, Denny McLean is now through. After pitching three perfect innings and leaving, leading one to nothing. 2-2 pitch coming up from Bunning. Big curve, he got him on the inside corner, strike three, Robinson is out. I don't think Robbie liked that pitch, Jimmy. He hesitated at home plate, looked at the plate umpire, and is walking away slowly right now, but I think he thought the ball may have been inside. That is the first strikeout for Jim Bunning and the second for the National League. Here's Tony Oliva, who lined to Willie Mays in center field to lead off the second inning. Minnesota Twins, American League batting champion. Running throws, and there's a drive in the left field. Coming over is Aaron, and going out is Cotinus, and Cotinus takes it on the dead run for the third out. 
No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left as Bunning sets him down one, two, three. The score at the end of the first half of the fourth inning is American League one and National League nothing. Lisa, it's happened. Oh, no. Yes, our family size right guard is empty. Oh, Jim. We'll buy another together. Gillette Right Guard, the perfect personal family deodorant, because nothing touches you but the spray itself. Two seconds gives you 24-hour protection, protection that lasts far longer with regular use. Look, Lisa, our new family size Right Guard. Enough to last forever. Well, almost. Now's the time to try new Gillette Foamy Shaving Cream. Gillette packs a mountain of smooth shaving comfort into every can of new Gillette Foamy. You get billows of creamy, rich, whisker-wilting foamy lather that soaks deep down into your beard. Keeps it soft and moist right through your shave. Nobody makes a lather like foamy. So moist, so rich, so creamy. Nobody makes a lather like Gillette. The three-day flight of the Man Gemini 10 is scheduled Monday, July the 18th. For full and comprehensive coverage of this, the most complex mission, follow it on NBC Radio and Television starting at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, Monday, July the 18th. Well, the American Leaguers, who lead by the score of 1-0 as we move to the bottom of the fourth, have a brand-new pitcher. After Denny McLean worked three innings, giving up no runs, no hits, no errors, no nothing, because McLean set the side down in order three separate times, and he struck out three men. It is Jim Cott of Minnesota, a fine hitting pitcher, and Tony Kubek, what kind of pitcher is Cott? Jim Cott, basically, Jim, is... A fastball, curveball pitcher. He has to keep his stuff low to be effective. He is not overpowering towards the sinker ball and the curveball. Well, the National League will move to the top of their batting order. Willie Mays, Roberto Clemente, and Hank Aaron. They trail 1-0. And remember, overall, the National League has won 18 ball games. The American League, 17, and has been one tie in all-star play. Here is Willie Mays, who was caught looking on a curveball from Denny McLean back in the first inning. Cott, a left-handed pitcher, gives him a fastball. Inside and low, it is ball one. Cott's record on the year he is 1-11, lost six, earn run average 2.75. Walked only 24, but struck out 87. There's a line drive, probably fall in for a base hit. The first hit of the National League. Fielded in left field by Frank Robinson. Mays is on with a single. Willie Mays, who has a bundle of all-star records, is adding to it every year. And at 35, Willie feels that maybe he can play as late as age 40. Here's Roberto Clemente, a 328 hitter in the regular season. He flied to K-line in center in the first inning. But the National League now has a man on base. They trail 1-0 to the American League here in the bottom of the fourth. Temperature's better than 100 degrees, and to complete what Tony Kubek said, the left field stands, and this is a sellout, remember, about, well, I'd say about 20 to 25 percent empty now as people have gone back into the shade. Got throws, and the man he started to offer held back and took strike one. Talking about records, Jim, that was Willie May's 22nd hit in all-star competition, and that's another record. Mays with a fair lead off first base. George Scott holding against him. Cott remembers a left-hander. Here's a swing on a fastball by Clemente, and it is strike two. Cott had Willie jumping back toward first base that time. Of course, you remember Clemente can't hit the ball to all fields. Is a good hit and run man, and with Willie on first base, the National League's liable to try and steal a run here, steal that extra base. Mays has stolen four bases this year. Certainly not a high total, but nevertheless, he is, of course, a threat and can go at any time. And dealer percentages are in his favor. Leads off. Outside is the pitch to Clemente. It is one and two. Nobody out in the fourth. American League leading one nothing. But the National League has come back with its first hit. Now facing Jim Cott, Minnesota. There have been no other changes except pitching changes and one pinch hitter. Cott's ready and throws the fastball. This one is lined, and I believe it will drop in. It does. It handcuffs K-Line. May stops at second. And then K-Line rifles a throw on one hop to Brooks Robinson at third. Men on first and second. None out. And as you 
Rogers had the ball handcuffed K-line in center field. He was playing for many in right center field. And a line drive, he did not catch it in his glove. He actually caught it in his stomach and more trapped the ball against his body than catching it. Well, Bill Freehan of Detroit has run out to talk to Jim Cott. Perhaps under the stands where they warm up. The American League's Sam Neely may be getting someone ready. Two straight base hits, both of them line drives by Mays and Clemente. And here is Hank Aaron with 67 RBIs this year. He was caught looking to end the first inning on a strikeout by Denny McLean. But this is a different situation. Men on first and second, none out. The National Leaguers trail 1-0. Caught the pitcher. Knopf starts towards second but comes back as Cott throws outside with an off-speed pitch and it's 1-0 to Hank Aaron. Aaron stepped out for the moment and looked down to coach Harry Walker, the manager of the Pirates, who is coaching at third base. Cott looks back, throws high to Aaron, and it is 2-0. Now the crowd begins to sense that perhaps Cott isn't going to give Aaron two something good and may lose him on pitches. It is 2-0. Conversely, Hank can now begin to look for his pitch with men on base and out in front of the pitcher. The throw by Cott. Hits straight up in the air, and it may come back and even hit us. Nope, it's upstairs. 2-1 to Aaron. It appears that Willie Mays at second base is rattling Jim Cott somewhat because he's taking a real big lead, and Bobby Knopf, the American League second baseman, is jogging around trying to keep Willie close, and I think Cott may be afraid to pitch sometimes with Knopf not in position. Cott taking the long look in to Hank Aaron with a 2-1 count. Son has mercifully gone behind the clouds for just a moment. Cott throws. Aaron hits it straight in the air. There'll be a play on this one, I believe. Over his freehand, but George Scott of Boston waves him away and takes it for the first out. Mays bluffs toward third. And up comes over to second, and Willie is walking slowly back. Scott is holding on the ball, and now underhands it to Cott. One down, still men on first and second. And here is big Willie McCovey, the first baseman of the San Francisco Giants. He popped out to Robinson in the second inning. McCovey is a left-hander, of course, and Cott is a left-handed pitcher. On deck is Ron Santo. McCullough dashed in the back of Willie Mays, but now goes back as Cott concentrates on McCovey. Inside, ball one. Jim Cott is especially tough on left-handed hitters. He has the type of fastball that sinks, and should he get it up, moves into a right-handed or left-handed hitter rather. Well, the National Leaguers have now out hit the American Leaguers, but they still trail 1-0 here in the fourth. Pitch and fouled at the plate and rolls off toward the National League dugout, and it's 1-1 one and one to McCovey. Scott's the first baseman, Knopf at second, McAuliffe at short, Robinson at third, Frank Robinson in left, Al Kalon in center, Oliva in right, Bill Freehan the catcher, and now Jim Cott doing the pitching. And this the fourth inning. The set and the pitch, and he hits it off the fist, down to George Scott. Scott's going down to second for one, and that's all there'll be. The force at second base on Roberto Clemente as Mays moves to third, but Cott now has two of the National Leaguers down with Ron Santo coming up. To give you an idea of the National League speed, Clemente, the runner on first base, almost beat Scott's throw into second base, and McAuliffe had to catch it and rapidly get out of the way. Here is Santo, who hit a line drive that Brooks Robinson dove toward the left field line and made a great catch on. Santo with 40 RBIs can rip that ball, and as a right-handed batter to face the left-hander, Cott. Mays is at third. McCovey is at first. They're giants at the corners. Two down in the fourth inning. American League in front. one nothing. although they have been out. Hit by the National League. Throw by Cott. Off-speed pitch. Fails to come in. Stays outside. It's ball one. Thus far, the catcher, Bill Freehan of the American League, has set a pretty good pattern of trying to pitch all of these National League hitters outside. He's sitting mostly on that outside corner and trying to get his pitchers to shoot for that target. He wants to stay away from their power. Mays has a good lead down the third baseline. As Cott throws... Santo did not believe it was over, but 
Umpire Al Barlick says it is, and it's one and one. Off-speed pitch at the knees. Robinson keeps moving in from third behind Willie Mays. Mays talking to the coach, Harry Walker, over there. McCovey staying pretty close to first base for that left-handed pitcher. Two down. One and one to count to Santo. Dots ready and throws, and it's fouled. Look out in the stands on the right side. Skips up and is one-handed by a customer who's wearing a pith helmet. To ward off this side, which has now come back out. One ball, two strikes to Santo. The fourth inning of the 1966 All-Star Game. Out with a new ball, looking in for the sign from Bill Freehand. That is ready. One-two pitch, change up, outside, it's 2-2. Tony, I don't believe the people are going too far. Some of the seats that are vacant have now been taken again. Everyone is fanning themselves. They must go under the stands and simply cool off in this 100-degree-plus heat and then come back in. In any event, here's the 2-2 pitch. Rounded. Robinson will have to hustle. At third, cannot make a play. Tano is safe. May scores. It's 1-1. McCovey moves to second. The ball was not hit hard. It was topped down the third baseline. Brooks Robinson had to make a hurried play. Came in as quickly as he could. Just could not handle the ball. And I don't believe Jimmy would have had a chance at Santo if he had fielded the ball cleanly. Well, the official scores feel the same way, Tony. They've given him an infield hit. Robinson made a great try, but it's the third hit of the inning, and we've got a tie ball game. It's 1-1. Here's Joe Torrey, who struck out swinging. Back in the second inning and takes strike one from Jim Bunny. While Danny McLean, who pitched three perfect innings and struck out three, can no longer win this ball game. The Nash and Lakers have fought back against Jim Cott. Still two down here in the fourth. Dot throws to Torrey. Round ball, McAuliffe underhands it to Knopp at second for the force play, and that's it. One run on three hits, no errors, and two men left. And the score at the end of the fourth inning is the American League won, the National League won. Rules, rules. Sometimes you're for them and sometimes you're against them, but the world of sport would not exist without them. The rule book of a sport isn't just a set of laws made to be broken, but they are the rules of common courtesy. And if they aren't observed, the game would be chaos. It's true in most everything we do, like driving. Traffic rules are based on common courtesy, and it's even true in business. The best businesses are run by the rules of courtesy, like your Chrysler Plymouth and Dodge dealer. He calls his rule book customer care. What's that mean? It means when you bring your car in for service, he's nice to you. Every rule of courtesy is observed. Why? Because he wants you to come back. But he doesn't base his business on bedside manner alone. He's got certified service. Factory trained mechanics using genuine Mopar Chrysler parts. Fix only what needs to be fixed. So if you're looking for the best service in the book, see the guys who play by the rules with customer care. Your Chrysler Plymouth or Dodge dealer. Tony Kubek along with Jim Simpson at the 1966 All-Star Game. The American League, one run, one hit, no errors. The National League, one run, three hits, and no errors. And Tony, here's the man who has the only run of the ball game for the American League, Brooks Robinson, who swings on the first pitch from Jim Bunning to start the fifth at strike one. Bunning came on in relief of Sandy Koufax, who gave up one run on one hit and a wild pitch, and got Kaline, Robinson, and Oliva in the fourth inning. He is now pitching his second inning. The one-strike pitch from the right-handed Bunning is outside to the right-handed batter, Brooks Robinson. Ball one. One and one. And, Jim, if the mass exodus from the sun into the shade continues in this ballpark in St. Louis, we're going to have absolutely no one sitting in the sun in another inning or two. Down ball. This should be a shot for Cardenas at short. He's up with it. Side arms it to the cubby at first, and there's one out in the fifth inning. That was the ball that never took a real hop. It just hugged the grass, made it to the dirt. Cardinal scooped it up and threw out Brooks Robinson. Here is George Scott, who fouled the McCovey at first in his only other time at bat, the rookie first baseman from Boston. 
Temperatures better than 100 degrees in St. Louis and a real hot all-star baseball game. Curve ball catches the outside corner. Fine pitch by Jim Bunning. Jim Bunning, of course, a big right-hander. Throws a lot of sidearm, scares a lot of right-handed hitters out of the batter's box. Has a wide, sweeping curveball and a hard fastball. One strike pitch to Scott. Outside, it's one and one. And Bunning's follow-through, Jim, is something to see. He takes that right leg and wraps it completely around his left and his face completely towards center field when he finishes up. It seems as though he would not be able to feel the ball at all if it were hit back at him. Curve ball outside. It is two and one. One out in the fifth inning. The score is one one. In the second inning, Brooks Robinson tripled past Aaron, scored on a wild pitch. In the fourth inning, the National Leaguers put together three hits, including an infield hit by Ron Santo, which drove in Willie Mays with the tying run. And that's the scoring to now. Here's the two and one pitch to Scott outside, and it is three and one to George Scott. Bill Freehand, the Detroit catcher, on deck. Talking about Bunning's follow through many. Pubs in the American League when Bunning was with the Detroit Tiger Ball Club started to bun him toward the third base side, and Jim did have some difficulty getting over. Here's a 3 1 pitch, and Scott is swinging. It's 3 and 2. By the way, the American League bat boy is Jay Mazon from Baltimore. At age two and a half, he was in a fire and lost both of his hands, but has the use of artificial hands. Does not feel that he's handicapped at all. Plays baseball. Fine bat boy. And the American League has wanted him. And here he is. Scott hits this one straight up in the air. Backing up his Lefebvre at second base. Waving everybody away. And has it for the second out. That will bring up Jim, or rather Bill Freehand, who lined to Clemente in right field in the second inning. One to one to score. Two down in the fifth. In a game that either despite the heat or because of the heat, is moving right along less than an hour old, and here we are at the fifth inning. Bunning ready for his first pitch to freehand. Right-hander against right-hander. Curves him, but it's outside, ball one. You're listening to the 1966 All-Star Baseball Game exclusively on NBC Radio, and we will bring you the World Series later this year. Running ready and throws. This one is down the pike. It's one and one. And it appeared that Freehand was taking all the way. It's just the fourth inning, and Bill Freehand does not have a dry spot in his body. He's working hard back there. And I imagine he's he's getting a little tired. Freehand has been a workhorse for Detroit, catching most of its games. Here's a big curve, and Freehand is way out in front of it. That curve started in at Freehand's left shoulder, which faces the pitcher. And broke all the way back in and over the plate. It was a good pitch, but had freehand swinging and missing. It's one and two. Running ready again. Fires this one a fastball, which is low and away, and it's 2-2. The crowd at this moment rather quiet in the 1-1 ball game, top of the fifth inning. On a hot afternoon. Many of these ball players have come in in private planes. Many have come in in private cars. Many have come in by train because of the partial airline strike. Bunning throws. There's the ball that may get through the infield and does pass Cardenas. And Freehand has the second hit of the ball game for the American League. A single to center. The ball was not hit really hard. It was to Cardenas' left, right up the middle. But we had an idea of how hard this... St. Louis infield is. It's been baked, as we mentioned, and the ball just scooted right on by him and went out to center field. Well, with two down in the fifth, here's Bobby Knopp, who grounded to Santo at third in the third inning. And to repeat, both managers have gone all the way with their starting lineups, with the exception of the pitchers. We're now in the fifth inning. Bunning throws, and it's foul to the screen by Knopp. Strike one. Bill Freehand at first with two down. Bill Freehand is one of the few catchers in baseball that'll take a chance and try and steal a base. He runs fairly well, does not steal a lot of bases, but he can steal a base off certain pitchers if he should get a good jump. 
Bobby Knopf, 224 in the regular season with what a fielder he is and with a chance now to move that runner, freehand up, takes the curveball, picks on it, but fouls it into the right field stands. Count us two strikes to Knopf, who spells his name K-N-O-O-P. Can generate power. He has hit 11 home runs this year and has knocked in a bundle of runs, 44. Fifth inning of the 1966 All-Star Baseball game, and the score is 1-1. Running nods to his catcher, Torrey. Now throws a big curve that stays inside, and it's... Ball to Kanaf. One and two. Cap, of course, is not known for his prowess with the bat. He is basically a defensive player, and having him in the lineup is equivalent to saving a few runs or having a few runs driven in. Another curveball, and Knopf strikes out. No runs, one hit, no errors, and one left. The score at the end of the first half of the fifth inning remains the American League one and the National League one. I've just run out. You've just run out? I'm out of cigarettes. Well, try one of mine. Try one of yours? Sure. Try one of mine. Have a Salem. Salem is the best of cigarettes that refreshes your taste for you. Salem is the best of cigarettes all of America's turning to. When you buy a best of cigarettes, don't take anything but the best. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. This is WGY, WGFM, Schenectady. The Carl W. List truckload sale is on with the biggest bargains ever offered in the 38-year history of Carl W. List. Special hours are in effect July 14th only, open until 9 p.m. Don't miss out on these bargains. Here are just a few. GE Disposal, only $27.04. 4,000 BTU GE air conditioners, only $99. And GE full-size wall ovens, only $78.14. Many are one of a kind, so it's first come, first served. Don't miss this Bargain Hunter's truckload sale at Carl W. Liss, 136 Erie Boulevard, Schenectady. Followed by Carnivus, who is on deck. And the question will then become, will they bat for Jim Bunning or allow Bunning, a pretty good hitting pitcher, to bat for himself? There's a drive to left field. Frank Robinson is back near the warning track and has it for the first out. Lefevre flies to left. And here's Leo Cardenas, who line to the second baseman, Knopf, in the third inning. And Robbie almost trapped the ball. Sorry, Tony. Excuse me, Jim. Warming up for the National League is Juan Marichal right now, so we may see a pinch hitter for Jim Bunning. He has not as yet entered the batting circle. Neil Cardenas facing Jim Cott. Off-speed pitch, which he picks on and skies it high and foul. And George Scott's at first chasing it and has it for the second out. Now with two down... We will see what the National League manager, Walt Alston, the Dodgers, will do. No one has yet made an appearance. In the on-deck circle, Marischal is warming up. And while we wait, some fans still think of the professional baseball player as Ring Lardner. Used to picture him a few decades ago. Actually, the average major leaguer today is an intelligent, well-educated young man. More than 50% of the major leaguers have a college education. Many players continue their schooling while following a professional career at the same time on scholarships provided by their original baseball contract. Well, from the Philadelphia Phillies, Richie Allen has been called on to hit for Jim Bunning. We'll give you Bunning's pitching record in a moment. Allen hitting 322, 58 RBIs, 21 home runs. A right-handed batter to face Jim Cott takes a strike. Allen has played a lot of infield, and this year, almost exclusively outfield for the Philadelphia Phillies.
One strike pitch, and he swings and misses. It is strike two to Allen. Willie Mays will be on deck. He has scored the only run for the National League in this 1-1 ball game. Richie Allen uses one of the heavier bats among today's modern-day ball players. The trend is toward lighter bats. Inside with the fastball, and it's one and two. Allen uses a 36-inch bat and sometimes wields a bat that weighs 40 ounces compared to most players wield a 32-ounce bat. Two out in the fifth. God is ready and strikes out Richie Allen to end the inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. The score at the end of the fifth inning is the American League 1 and the National League 1. Hello there, this is Leon Kelly. That familiar theme introduces Kelly's Corner, a weekday fair that begins at 6.15. Along with fine dinner music and rare stories of the odd, strange, and curious, we have special features. When it comes to racing, we have just about all the bases covered. It begins at 6.15 with Track Talk with Cup, behind-the-scenes views of the trotters, pacers, and the thoroughbreds. Mondays and Thursdays at 7.05, Bill Carpenter covers the stock car racing results from 14 tracks. This is NBC News. At 7, a summary of the news from NBC. This is Morgan Beatty bringing you NBC's News of the World. Kelly's Corner keeps you further informed at 7.30 when Morgan Beatty reports the news with on-the-scenes accounts of events from where it happens. Yes, you'll find it interesting, informative, and entertaining in Kelly's Corner weekdays, 6.15 until 8 on WGY Schenectady. The score, one-to-one, a tie ball game here in the first of the sixth inning for the American League, two hits, no errors, one run, National League, one run, three hits, and no errors. And Tony, as Marischal moves in, Juan, the man with the big kick, in the on-deck circle is Harmon Killebrew. Apparently will bat for the pitcher Jim Cott. Bunning worked two innings, gave up one hit, struck out one, and not walked no one. He cannot win or lose the ball game as the score is tied at one apiece. Marichal this year has won 14 and lost four. His earned run average is 2.04. Harmon Killebrew this year is hitting 264, but he has 17 home runs and 48 RBIs. And we've had some changes in the umpires, as Jim told you about earlier. Jim Honacek of the American League is behind the plate now. Umont has moved to second base. Angle is on the right field line. Newdecker of the National League is on the left field line. Vargo is at first base, and Barlick, of course, has moved out of the uh, of the plate situation. Juan Marichal, and as he warms up, Killebrew prepares to step in. And Jim Cott worked two innings, gave up one earned run, three hits, struck out one, and walked no one. One one ball game. And Marichal, of course, this is his ball game at this moment to win or lose. Armin Killebrew, who hit a 
home run and all-star play a year ago, the slugger for the Minnesota Twins. They call him the killer, steps in to face Juan Marichal. Top of the sixth inning, one to one the score. The National League has made a defensive change. Jim Lefevre has left the second base position, and Ron Hunt of the New York Mets has moved into second base position. The announcement for Harmon Killebrew, who now steps into the box to face Juan Marichal. Marichal's first pitch after that big kick is outside, and it's ball one. And now we understand that Mel Stottlemyre, the New York Yankees, is warming up for the American League. Shell this time a sidearm motion with a curveball, and it's strike one. One and one to Killebrew. And, of course, the big discussion now, Jim, is who is the greatest pitcher, Marischal or Koufax, in that National League? They're both completely different. Marischal is a little bit cuter out there. The high kick again, overhand, and this one goes by Cardenas and into center field, and Killebrew has a hit on a 1-1 count. It looked like he had a low breaking ball, either a slider or a curveball. He reached out for it, what looked like a pretty good pitch, and hit it right up the middle. Well, Killebrew's number is three, and he is dressed in gray. Here is another man who's number in three and dressed in gray, but he is Dick McCullough. The all-star shortstop who was fouled out to Santo at third twice. Nobody out. High breaking run. Armin Killebrew at first base. Sneaking in at third is Ron Santo, anticipating a bunt, but... The call up watches a fastball, catch the inside corner, strike one. McCullough stepped out briefly to look down at Bertie Tebbets coaching at third base for the American League All Star team. Santos still on that grass, and another fastball from Marichal, and it is strike two. Neither time was McCullough actually preparing to bunt. At least we could not detect it. Two strike count with Killebrew at first. One to one the score. We're in the sixth inning from St. Louis with the temperature better than 100 degrees. Marichal throws, and this one is grounded foul, and Hank Bauer picks it up on the second hop in the coaching box at first base. Wonder why Sam Mealy did not have McCullough bunting well, probably because he is a left-handed hitter capable of pulling the ball, and with McCovey holding the runner close at first base, this gives the left-handed hitter a pretty good opening between that second baseman and first baseman, so McAuliffe is probably shooting for it. Two strike is the count, and here's the pitch, and this one is deep down the right field line if it stares fair, and it is foul. McAuliffe never left the batter's box, but that ball went on a line and high and deep down the right field line, and then at the last moment, curved foul, and the count remains two strikes. And the wind is absolutely no factor at all in this ball game. The flags are hanging completely limp, and it's hot. Fastball high and outside, and it's one and two. Marichal, as we mentioned, is a little bit cuter than Koufax is on the mound. He throws different deliveries, sidearm, underhand, sometimes overhand, screwballs, sliders. He's liable to throw any pitch from any different direction. Marichal looks over at Killebrew, who's very close, and now Juan steps off and goes for the rosin bat. Killebrew with just a short leadoff first. The set by Marichal. One and two the count. McAuliffe waits and strikes out. Swinging. Now here's our K-line, who has been breaking up ball games for the Detroit Tigers all year long, especially in recent weeks. But in this ball game, he is fouled to the first baseman and popped to the second baseman. A line of 325 hitter comes up with one man down, and Killebrew perched at first base in a 1 1 ball game in the sixth, the American League at bat. National League infield, of course, is at double play depth, and they're playing K line about straight away in the infield, slightly to pull in the outfield. That's shot with that high kick, and a breaking ball stays high, and it's ball one. Marichal, Tony, looks as though he's got a pretty hard slider as well as a curve and a fastball. Overhand pitch, base hit, center field. Killebrew will stop at second as up with it is Willie Mays and in deference to his arm as Willie fires the ball into Cardenas. K-line stops at first and Killebrew at second. And 
And now Jim Fregosi is coming out of the American League All-Star dugout and is going out to second base to run for Harmon Killebrew. So Fregosi runs for Killebrew. One run, four hits now for the American League. No errors. One run, three hits, and no errors for the National League. And Frank Robinson, who has flied to left and has been called out on strikes, is the batter. Well, I imagine Frankie'd like to do the National League a little dirt right now, Jim. I just, he probably has a little bit of a personal grudge against most of these players. He's, he's a fierce competitor, and he wants to get out there and beat this ball club probably more than any of the other American leaguers. There's Gerald in trouble with men on first and second, and Robinson hits the first pitch high in foul territory. And McCovey is over near the stands and has it. And they are two down. And that brings up another fine hitter in Tony Oliva. Marichal in momentary trouble on singles by Killebrew and Kaline now has the second man out, and Oliva, who is lined to center and popped to the shortstop, is the batter. Down in the sixth on a hot afternoon in a classic ball game, you could not want a better ball game. You could want it a few degrees cooler, but it is one to one. There have been some fine pitching performances. Notably, Denny McLean and Jim Bunning. Oliva, the left-hander, staring at Marischal, the right-hand. Marischal with a big kick fastball. Oliva swings, and it's strike one. You don't see too many of these hitters up there going up there and taking it, but they're all up there swinging. They're... They know these pitchers are coming in with that fastball, that first pitch, on this hot day, and they're up there taking a good cut at it. Fergosi at second, has stolen nine bases. K-line at first, a fine base runner, two down. Marichal delivers, ground ball. This is Ron Hunt at second, who throws to McCovey at first, and that's the inning. No runs on two hits, no errors, and two men left. And the score at the end of the first half of the sixth inning remains the National League one and the American League one. If you own an electric razor, I want to give you fair warning. Do not listen to what I'm going to say, especially if you're happy with your shaver. And if you want to stay happy with it, because Gillette has some news that may make you very unhappy with your electric shaver. Use about a razor blade, a new razor blade, with a miracle plastic coating baked onto the edge, invented and patented by Gillette. If you try this blade, here is what we predict will happen. One... You will discover that this isn't just a new blade, but a whole new standard of shaving. Two, you feel how much less pull there is with that plastic coating on the edge. Three, you will be hopelessly spoiled. Four, you may never be able to go back to your electric razor. And five, you won't know whether to thank us or write us a nasty letter. Are you game enough to give it a try? Ask for the spoiler, alias the Gillette Super Stainless. Jim Fregosi has gone in to play shortstop for the American League team, and on the pitch is Mal Stottlemyre. The score is still one-to-one, last half of the sixth inning. One run, four hits, no errors for the American League. One run, three hits, and no errors for the National. The three-day flight of the man Gemini 10 is scheduled Monday, July 18th for full and comprehensive coverage of this, the most complex mission. Follow it on NBC Radio and Television starting at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, Monday, July the 18th. Now it looks as though Earl Batty is coming out here in the sixth inning, the bottom of the sixth, and will do the catching, replacing freehand for the American League. And we will pick up the spots in which they will bat as they are announced to us. But right now, we see Fergosi at shortstop replacing McCullough, and Batty catch it. Fergosi, of course, ran for Killebrew, who was batting for the pitcher, so we assume he is in the number nine batting spot. Willie Mays up swings and misses at the first pitch from Jim Cott. One to one to score. Mays has been called out on strikes, has singled, 
moved around the third, and then scored on an infield hit by Ron Santo, the only National League run. Dots ready with a one-strike pitch. Fastball, and May swings again at a strike two. Clemente is coming out on deck. Stottlemyre is a low ball pitcher. He keeps that sinker down. He's very tough, and you'll see a lot of ground balls to your infielders. He also throws a sidearm curve and a real hard slider. He has a great deal of control. One and two from Stottlemyre. I believe I said Cott. It is Mel Stottlemyre as Killebrew batted for Cott. Stottlemyre, a right-hander from the Yankees. Bobby Richardson, the other member from New York on this team. One and two pitch. Her ball just misses. And in mentioning the Yankees, Jim, it's unusual not to see a Mickey Mantle and Elston Howard, a Whitey Ford on these all-star squads. Seven and ten, Stottlemyre's record. 3.23 is earned run record. Mays hits this one deep to center, but not too deep, as Kaline actually comes in now and takes it. Ball started out as a carry very deeply, but did not. Kaline takes it for the first down. Here is Roberto Clemente, who has fly to center and has singled. Roberto singled Mays down to second base, was later forced by Willie McCovey in the fourth inning, in which the National League scored its only run. Talking to Willie Mays before the ball game about how the ball carries in this ballpark, and he feels that from left center down the left field line and from right center down the right field line, the ball carries real well. If you get the ball in the center field, the ball does not carry quite as well as that one did not. Pitch, and this one is lined inside the line, down the first base line. Clemente on his way around first, over to pick it up as the lever. Guns the ball towards second base, but Clemente is in standing up. A double for Roberto Clemente, his second hit in a row. He has two of the four National League hits. And now the National League has a chance to break the top. One to one in the sixth inning with one down. The National League, the home team at bat. Here's Hank Aaron, a fine hitter with 26 home runs, 67 RBIs. But in this ball game, he's been called out on strikes and has fouled out to the first baseman, George Scott. That was a line drive by Clemente off the end of his bat, right hugging the bag and down the right field line. Stottlemyre works. Ground ball this time to Brooks Robinson. A great pickup by Brooks. Over to Scott. Clemente holds on, and they're two down. The ball has hit two Robinsons right at third base, and he went over to his right to the foul line and scooped it up, making that same play he does all the time and making it look easy again. Well, here is Willie McCovey, who has popped to Robinson and has reached on a fielder's choice, and they're going to put him aboard. With a right-handed Ron Santo due up, and startled by a right-handed pitcher. And with two down, manager Sammy Lee, playing the obvious percentages, will give an intentional pass to Willie McCovey. And this will be the first walk of any kind in this ballgame. Ball four, and McCovey trots slowly down toward first base. Now, here is Ron Santo playing the percentages in that Ron is a right-handed batter, but remember, he has lined to Robinson, who made a great play, and has hit a little infield single to Robinson that scored the only run of the ball game for the National League. There are two down on the bottom of the sixth. The score is one to one. McCovey's at first, Clemente's at second, and Stottlemyre now faces Ron Santo. And you wonder when the last time was, if at all, that an intentional pass was given up to get the Santo. Jim Honachick, who started out this game umpiring at third, is behind the plate and calls that first pitch from Stottlemyre, curveball, strike one. Now Bollock was behind the plate, has moved to third base. Ed Vargo is at second, has gone to first, and Frankie Mon at first has gone to second. The umpires, like everybody else, trying to beat the heat. Clemente at second, McCovey at first. One strike to Santo, two down. Stottlemyre ready and throws, and Santo grounds this one to Robinson, who's down and forces the man at second base for the throw to Bobby Kanaf. No runs, one hit, no errors, and two left. And the score at the end of the sixth inning remains the National League one and the American League one. I've got to 
figure out how they do it. How the Chrysler dealers can sell those big, beautiful new Chryslers for so little. You see, I'm a test pricer. I test price cars all over town. And I thought I knew a good deal when I heard one. But then, I test priced a Chrysler Newport with all the extras like automatic transmission, power steering, power brakes, radio, heater, white walls, and a big 383 cubic inch V8. <laughs> and you know, it came out that a Chrysler is priced just a few dollars a month more than one of those smaller cars with the same equipment. But test price a Chrysler yourself. Your Chrysler dealer has immediate delivery on all models and all colors. See him soon. The Chrysler saving season is here. Test price a Chrysler. See your local Chrysler dealer. Moving up has never been easier. Shortstop Cardenas. Santo, the third baseman in the infield. Well, over 49,000, darn nearly 50,000 here. 49,936 paid as Brooks Robinson, who came up with a great play and has scored the only run for the American League, steps in against Juan Marichal. Norm Cash is on deck. Robinson takes a curveball, strike one. Due up next is George Scott, but Norm Cash set to bat, and being a first baseman on the course, probably will move in defensively. Maris Chow, Tony pointed out to me, actually ran to the mound to begin this inning. And in better than 100-degree heat, it doesn't seem like the thing to do, does it? Ball one. One and one. Nobody out in the seventh inning. The score remains one to one. Now Shell ready with a high kick and throws high. It's two and one. We'll recall again, the National League has won 18 of these all-star contests. The American League, 17. There's been one tie. But the National League has won 14 of the last 19, seven of the last eight. Now Shell is ready at two and one and throws high and away from Brooks Robinson. It is three and one. The National League infield and outfield have swung around the extreme left for Brooks Robinson, the right hand and the other. They're playing him to pull in the infield and the outfield. Then one pitch, and he's swinging on it and fouls it. Whoops. There a foul. Foul, says Jim Homachick, and Brooks Robinson will have to come back. It was that close. Sando, I believe, was in fair territory. His glove was in foul. Homachick, the plate umpire, says come back to Brooks. And it's three and two. Brooks operating with that bat a little bit, trying to get the dampness off of it. Bats, pencils, pens, everything are damp out here. And very hot weather. Each team has four hits. Marichal throws three and two, and Robinson lines a base hit to left field. That is his second, and he is two for three. Robinson hit a curveball on the line to left field to Aaron. Looked like a pretty good pitch, Jim. Uh, I think Marichal thought it was, too. He doesn't seem too worried out there that he isn't, doesn't have his stuff. Well, here is Norm Cash. He was in the on-deck circle and obviously will come into play first base. Norm this year is hitting 259, but he can hit the long ball. 12 home runs, 11 doubles, 1 triple, a 259 average. And importantly, a left-handed batter to face the right-handed Marichal with none down and Brooks Robinson at first. There's a ball hit down to McCovey. McCovey has trouble getting out of his glove. Back to Cardenas and back to McCovey. That's a double play. For a while, it looked as though Willie was not going to be able to dig that ball out of his glove, but got it down to Cardenas, and he relayed the ball back, and Cash is hit into a double play. And here comes Earl Batty, who is filling in for Bill Freehand. Freehand and his two times at bat, line to right and single to center. Batty up for the first time. Earl, the right-handed batter, hitting 280, 16 RBIs, two home runs. Strike on the outside corner. And, Tony, it says here that Earl has stolen two bases. Well, many times the catcher, Batty, of course, is not very fast, but... 
strike on the outside corner. It's two strikes to batter. Whitey Ford also is not very fast from the Yankees, but you get these slower runners, and that first baseman plays way behind them. They give a good decoy leading off first base, and they can steal a base occasionally. Two down, none on now. Marichal delivers, and Donnie slices this one foul down the right field line and well back in the seats. Down remains two strikes. We're in the seventh inning of a 1-1 ball game. Batty, along with Ron Santo of the National League, is one of the players in this game wearing a helmet protecting the left side of their face. Two-strike pitch outside and low. It's one and two. The American League scored its run in the second inning when Brooks Robinson tripled, came home on Sandy Koufax's wild pitch. The National League scored in the fourth inning. Willie Mays scored the run on an infield hit, beat out by Ron Santo. And that's it. We're in the top of the seventh. One and two. Marichal ready and throws, and Batty strikes out. No runs, one hit, no errors, and none left. The score at the end of the first half of the seventh inning, American League one, National League one. I've done it again. Done what again? Come out without cigarettes. Well, here, try one of mine. Ah, oh, that's okay. I... Here, try one of mine. Have a Salem. Salem is the man called cigarettes that we fresh in your taste for you. Salem is the man called cigarettes of all of America turning to. When you buy a man called cigarettes, don't take anything but the best. Salem is the man called cigarettes. Jim Simpson with Tony Kubek, the bottom of the seventh inning, the National League at bat, Joe Torrey, who was struck out swinging and hit into a forced play as the batter. As we have Norm Cash now at first, Bobby Knopf of California stays at second, Jim Fergosi is your shortstop, Brooks Robinson at third, the catch is Earl Batty, and the outfield remains the same. Robinson in left, Kalon in center, Oliva in right. Here's Torrey, who's gone all the way and has caught seven innings. For the National League, Stottlemyre throws a curveball over the plate, but low, ball one. Dottie giving the signs to Stottlemyre, who comes in with the fastball inside. It is ball two. Ron Hunt, who replaced Jim Lefevre, will get his first shot at bat in a moment. Stottlemyre throws. This one is low, and it is ball three to Torrey in a 1-1 ball game. And in the sun field on the left field side, and as a matter of fact, in the right field side, the customers in this better than 100 degree heat continue to shuttle back and forth between their seats and under the stands. Fouled upstairs by Joey, it is 3 and 1. Joe is swinging on the 3 and 0 pitch. So far, Jim, we've had a reversal in the manager's pregame strategy. Mealy said he would go along all the way with his front eight, and he's made three de- defensive changes shortstop, first base, and catch. Round ball, hit by Troy. Robinson waits for the second hop, hurries his throw, and has Joe by plenty of steps. Of course, aside from the pitching changes, manager Walt Olson has made just one. He's moved Ron Hunt into the second base position. Well, here is Ron Hunt up for the first time, and Willie Stargell of the Pirates, a 337 hitter, has come out on the on-deck circle to hit for Leo Cardenas. Hunt hitting 293, 23 RBIs, and three home runs on the year, and the pride of the New York Mets. All-star second baseman last year, Stottlemyre throws, strike one to Hunt. Tony and I were in Pittsburgh over the weekend to watch the Mets play the Pittsburgh Pirates, and Stodgill, who is on deck now, tore down Forbes Field. He rattled doubles and home runs all around that stadium. Low from Stottlemyre to Hunt, and it's one and one. Warming up now for the National League is Perry of the San Francisco Giants. One to one to score. Stottlemyre throws curveball. Hunt ducked away, but actually it wasn't that far inside. Nevertheless, it is ball two, two and one. 
appear, Jim, that Hunt was actually ducking into the ball a little bit, trying to get hit by it. He's that type of player. He'll get on base anyway and beat you any way he can. Fastball hits in the dirt. Patty blocks it, picks it up, and it is three and one. Now Stottlemyre had Torrey three and zero, and Joe swung on the three and zero pitch, fouled it off, and then grounded to Brooks Robinson. Now the count is three and one to Hunt. Stottlemyre is ready. Here's a three and one pitch, bounded back. In quickly is Fergosi near second base, side arm toward an arm, cash at first, and they're two down. Terry one at the national Willie Stargell is coming into bat, so I would imagine in a short while, in the next inning, you will see Maury Wills, who is not selected as the number one shortstop this year, at shortstop for the National League. Want to hear something? Listen to Mr. Stargell's statistics. 337 is batting average. 63 RBIs. 22 home runs. Willie Stargell of the Pirates now batting with two out in the seventh inning. Facing Stottlemyre, Stargell is the left hand and watches a fastball, strike one. Sonny Seward is now warming up for the American League, and of course, everybody will remember his pitching performance on a no hitter earlier this year. Low, it's one and one. Seward also threw a one hitter. Mel Stottlemyre, working in bed in 100 degree heat, throws a curveball and catches the inside corner. And Willie has not taken the bat off his shoulder yet. It is one and two. The Carver is up. The pinch hit. Fastball, and Sargell fouls this one down the left field side. The pitcher is due up next. And if Stargell can reach base, McCarver will do the batting for him. The American League defense is playing him to pull. Outside from Stottlemyre. And it's 2-2. Bobby Knopf, the second baseman, is actually back almost five yards on the grass in right field. But we saw Willie Stargell last week, as you mentioned, Jim, tore down the left field fence a couple of times. Outside, barely missing, and it has gone all the way on Stargell. Three and two. Two down here in the seventh inning in a 1-1 ball game. Stottlemyre toiling in the last of seventh for the New York Yankees and the American Lakers. Colfax and Marichal have already worked. So has Denny McLean. Curveball, and this one has popped up. Foul off the third baseline. Brooks Robinson comes over and has it for the third out. Stargell fouls to Robinson. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And the score at the end of the seventh inning is the American League one, the National League one. This is WGY News. This is the sound that means news. Up to the minute, concise and complete. From the facilities of NBC, Associated Press, United Press International, the United States Weather Bureau, a staff of stringers throughout a 26-county area, and a newsroom staff of experienced news people, WGY keeps you informed of the latest happenings. More than 20 times a day in regularly scheduled newscasts from 6 in the morning to midnight, WGY brings you the latest news from around the world, around the area, and across the street. And when something newsworthy happens, you get it in bulletin form when it happens. All this, plus specialized programs on farm news, sports, weather, and business, make WGY's news department your best information center for what's going on in the world today. Tony Kubek along with Jim Simpson here in St. Louis at the All-Star Game. One to one the score, five hits for the American League and four hits for the National League. Not an error been made in this ball game yet. Maury Wills has gone in to play shortstop for the National League. And the hand you hear is partly for Maury, but I think mostly for Tim McCarver of the St. Louis Cardinals who has come in to catch. And batting to lead off against Juan Marichal as we move now to the eighth in this tie ball game, this 1966 All-Star Baseball game from New York, Bobby Richardson. Bobby batting in the spot, formerly occupied by Bobby Knopf, the second baseman from the California Angels. 
Richardson hitting 263, 20 RBIs, four home runs. Bought an all-star second baseman many times over. Eighth inning, and he'll face Juan Marichal. Gaylord Perry is warming up to pitch the ninth or to be ready in the eighth if needed, and we may have an extra inning ball game. It's 1-1. Marichal fires, and it's strike on the outside corner. Santo at third base has shortened up considerably. Richardson, of course, is a bunt threat. Wills is not playing too deep at short. They're playing him about straight away. Sidearm this time, and Murray Wills has his first chance on the second hop. The throw to McCovey at first, and his one down. Richardson bounces to Wills at short. Here is Jim Fergosi up for the first time. Killebrew singled back in the sixth inning, and Fergosi went in to run for him and stayed in the ball game. That shortstop from the California Angels. There's Shell Reddy. He throws a curveball. It's bounced foul to Santo at third. Fergosi hitting 248 on the year, 31 RBI, six home runs. Well, the sun again has disappeared for the moment. The temperature remains well above 100. And with the sun disappearing, some of the people are coming from under the stands and back to their seats. As shall throws outside, it is one and one to Jim Fergosi. And now out of the dugout for the American League, and in the batter circle is Rocky Colavito, who apparently is going to pinch hit. Fouled back. Pitch was actually a little inside to Fergosi, but he got the bat around on it and fouled it off to the left and over the dugout of the American Leaguers. One and two the count. Marichal ready again. Sun is out again. Sidearm curveball this time, and he did not go around. Marichal thought so. Either that, or thought that the ball had gone over the outside corner of the plate. Jim Honachik sees neither. It is two and two. Many people, of course, are predicting that Juan Marichal or Sandy Koufax or both can win 30 ball games. Two to the count. Fastball, but it's outside. It is three and two. Of course, in line with that, Dizzy Dean was the last pitcher to win 30 ball games, and right now, Koufax with 15 is right in line with Dizzy Dean's 30 game pace, and Juan Marichal is just four days behind him. Here's a 3 2 pitch with a big kick, and it's lined into right field. Clemente had a little late break on the ball, but got there in plenty of time for the second out. Dick McAuliffe, who fouled out twice and struck out. He fouled out twice against Sandy Koufax and struck out against Juan Marichal. He is up. And Rocky Calavito will bat for him. Marichal sidearms this curveball outside, and it's ball one to Calavito. Rocky, of course, plays with the Indians, having a 263 year, 16 home runs, 47 RBIs. And in a 1-1 ball game in late innings, all it takes is one swing from a man like Calavito to break things up. Overhand. Change up that time, and it is ball two. Marichal, Tony, is throwing quite a few pitches. Yes, he is. He's laboring out there. Uh, of course, Marichal is difficult, Jim, because he throws from so many different angles. You don't know where the pitch is coming from. As we mentioned, he's overhand sometimes, three quarters, all types of deliveries. Here's a 2-0 pitch, side on this time, and Calavito hits it straight up in the air to short left field. Aaron is coming in and waving off Mari Wills and has it for the third out. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And at the end of the first half of the eighth inning, the score is still. The National League won and the American League won. Hey, fellas, if you douse your hair with hair tonics that have too much alcohol, know what you can get? Drunk hair. And greasy creams, they can get your hair plastered. So swear off alcohol and give up grease. Change to Gillette Heads Up. It's based on a greaseless wonder synthetic. 
so clean, so natural, it grooms like water, only better. Won't dry up, won't plaster down. So, fellas, swear off drunk hair. Take the pledge. Use heads up and be heads up handsome. In writing, Paper Mate has a great trio, the famous Profile Trio. Three pens, each of a different size, shape, and weight to fit your writing preference. Buy the Paper Mate Husky for extra heft. Or maybe the average weight regular Paper Mate is for you. Or choose the Paper Mate Slim, light and compact. See the Paper Mate Profile Trio and pick the pen that's right for you from the Paper Mate Profile Trio. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. This is WGY, WGFM, Schenectady. It's happened, yes, through the spectacular efforts of every employee at Schenectady Plymouth, the Outstanding Chrysler Corporation Quality Dealer Award is theirs for the fifth time. Only seven dealerships out of the entire region will receive this award this year. This proves that the trying harder people at Schenectady Plymouth are offering the best in quality selection, used car warranty, and service. Why not stop in and see for yourself? That's Schenectady Plymouth, 1016 State Street in Schenectady. Go back along with Jim Simpson here in St. Louis at the All-Star Game. Defensively for the American League, it's Norm Cash at first. Richardson has come into play, second base. Fergosi at short. Brooks Robinson at third. Left field, Frank Robinson. Center field, Al Kaline. And right field, Tony Oliva. Catching, of course, is still Earl Batty. And the new pitcher for the American League, Sonny Siebert of the Cleveland Indians. Score still tied here, one to one. Last half of the eighth inning. Juan Marichal is due up but will not bat. Jim Ray Hart, his teammate from the San Francisco Giants, will bat for him. Hart, a 289 hitter, 48 RBIs, 20 home runs. Marichal worked three innings, gave up no runs, three hits, and struck out two and walked no one. The National League has walked nobody. The American League has walked one, Batman McCovey, intentionally. So well, here is Jim Ray Hart of the Giants. Right-handed batter against the right-handed Siebert. Ball is fouled back. Strike one. And apparently a good catch made upstairs. Siebert was added to the team when Sam McDowell, of whom many predict great things, came up with arm trouble, sat up a great deal of the first half of the season and removed himself, saying he's been ineffective and still not right. Hart swings and misses on this pitch from Siebert. It is strike two. One to one is the score. We are now... In the bottom of the eighth inning, a ball game that is less than two hours old moving right along, but so far tied, and the prospects of an extra inning ball game loom large. Here's the two-strike pitch from Siebert. Pass ball, got him on the outside corner. Strike three. Jim Ray Hart is out, and here is Willie Mays. Took a called third strike in the first inning from Denny McLean. Jim Cock got a single and scored the only run for the National League. And line to center off Mel Stottlemyre. It's this one to right center and deep. K-line is back though and has it for the second out. So far, the strategy of these American League pitchers has been pretty much the same. They've kept the ball away from these powerful National League hitters. Score still one-to-one. One run, five hits, no errors for the American League. For the National League, one run, four hits, no errors. Well, here's Roberto Clemente, who has flied to center and has singled and doubled. Two down in the eighth. Stottlemyre, since retired... Worked two innings, no runs and two hits. Struck out, no one. She was ready, and Mr. Clemente took a real swing. That's the biggest breeze in St. Louis in five days. (laughs) And Clemente, of course, has 13 home runs this year. Last year, I believe he had just eight. Last year, if you recall, he started out the season in a weakened condition due to a wintertime malaria attack. Even ready with a one-strike pitch. Breaking ball outside. It is one and one. Eighth inning, two down, one to one the score in St. Louis. Flagpole is absolutely... Well, the flag is just hanging there. 
Foul upstairs. It is one and two. Not a breath of air. Someone asked Casey Stengel. Casey was out here for a television show yesterday afternoon, and someone asked him what he thought of the ballpark. And, of course, Casey knows it is a remarkable piece of architecture, one of the finest-looking ballparks we have seen anywhere. But Casey had to come up with a Stengel-like remark and said, it's great. It keeps the heat in perfectly. One and two to count to Clemente. Seaver throws fastball, and it's fouled upstairs again down the right field line. It's interesting to see how these defenses play Clemente. He, of course, hits the ball all over, and he hit the ball last time. A line drive right down the first baseline, and this time up, Norm Cash is playing him like a strict left-handed pull hitter. Tony Oliva is playing him down the right field foul line. Al Kaline in his right center. He can hit it all over. One and two the count. Here's the pitch, and he fouls this one back. An inside and high pitch. And lost the bat from his right hand and quickly goes over and rubs some dirt on it. Cash at first, Richardson at second, Fredosi at short, Robinson at third. The outfields remain the same. Robinson in left, Kalon in center, Oliva in right. Batty is now the catcher. Siebert, the pitcher. Now Clemente is ready, and so is Siebert. Here's the one-two pitch. Breaking ball. It's hit foul again and again off to the right side. Besides the players in this contest, you look around and see some pretty good managers. Now Clemente's going over to get a towel to wipe himself off. It's just that hot, and the sweat is just dripping in his face, and he's going to get a towel to wipe himself off so he can see better. Talking about these managers, Harry Walker for the National League at third, challenging for the pennant. At first base, Herman Franks of the San Francisco Giants, presently in first base. Of course, Walt Austin managing this National League ball club. He's got a good shot the second half if Don Drysdale comes back. One-two pitch is outside to Clemente. It is two and two with two down in the last of the eighth inning. To repeat, the American League scored one run in the second inning, the National League one in the fourth, and that is it. 2-2 pitch. Round ball. This is Richardson's chance at second. Bobby's up with it and throws to Norm Cash for the third out. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And the score at the end of the eighth inning is the American League one, the National League one. The Dodge Boys are setting out to fight for the kind of deals you'll know are right. Pounding leather to get you and a great new Dodge together, the Dodge Boys. The good guys, they pound it on a great degree of cars you've got to see. These babies put you in the lead. Ride with the good guys, the Dodge Boys. So, partner, come on down for the best 66 in town at the Dodge Boys. Here's Monaco to top the bill. This car makes driving a brand new thrill. Carnet's got a lot of sass. Goes like no other car in its class. And here's the new leader of the whole Dodge pack, Charger, a new full-size fast pack. So join the Dodge Rebellion now and let these rebels show you how the Dodge boys. The good guys. You can tell they're good guys. They all wear white hats. Tony Kubek along with Jim Simpson here at the All-Star Game. The defensively for the National League, it's still Willie McCovey at first, Ron Hunt at second base, Maury Wills at shortstop, and Ron Santo at third base. In left field, Henry Aaron. In center field, Willie Mays. In right field, Roberto Clemente. Catching is Tim McCarver. And coming in to pitch for the National League, Gaylord Perry. The score, one to one, one run, five hits, no errors for the American League. The National League, one run, four hits, and no errors. Al Kaline, who is one for three, the batter, to lead off the ninth inning of this 1-1 ball game. And you can see what Wall Alston has done. The big men, McCovey, Santo, Aaron, Mays, Clemente, who can knock the ball out of here, are all playing all the way. One swing of the bat could decide this ball game. It's 1-1. Gaylord Perry knocks down Kaline with an inside fast curveball. steps off to brush himself off. 
to brush the mud off, Jim. Perry, there's been a lot of talk about Ron Marichal, but remember, Perry's won 12 games, lost only one. Earn run average, 2.51. Fine pitcher. This one is fouled right through the box, and Bertie Tebbets moves rather quickly and gets out of the way. And, Jim, we've got quite a pitcher's ball game up here. In fact, I've gotten so engrossed in this ball game, I misplaced my eighth inning on my scorecard. <laughs> you can borrow mine. Here's Kalon. One and one the count, facing Gaylord Perry. One to one the score, ninth inning. Ground ball. Santo backs up. Has it. Now throws to first and has Kalon by plenty for the first out. And the hand is for a real fine play by Santo. He ranged to his left, and the ball was hit pretty sharply. Made a real nice play. Frank Robinson is up, and Robbie, hitting 312 to start today, and batting in the number three position, is fly to left and called out on strikes and fouled to McCovey at first. Last time up, Robinson swung on the first pitch. Let's see what he does against Gaylord Perry. Pitch, and he swings on this one. In the alley, in left field. In comes Mays very quickly. Out goes Wills, and over the head. Makes the catch. Johnny Kubek, you're an ex-shortstop. You know how difficult that can be. It sure is, Jim. Wills made a great play with his back to the hitter. Took it at... Full speed, and of course there's a little problem with the sun today. He had the sun in his eyes a little bit too, but he went out there full speed and used that amazing speed of his to run it down. Here is Tony Oliva, lined to center, popped to short, and grounded the second. Perry's first pitch is right over. Fastball at the knees at strike one. Well, we have spoken a lot about the hot weather in this 1-1 ball game. 1-1-5 hits no errors for the American League. 1-4-0 for the National League. But Tony, personal discomfort aside, we are watching quite an all-star ball game. Outside corner to Oliva, and it is strike two. Fine pitching and some great defensive plays. Not too many by the outfield because the ball has not been hit to the outfield too often. It's the infielders and the pitchers who have shared the glory. Two strike pitch to Oliva. Foul. Look out down there in the boxes along the left field line. Two down in the ninth. One to one. Nobody on. We mentioned the National League coaches, who, of course, are managers in, in the National League. And, of course, we've got some pretty good ones here for the uh, American League, too, in Bertie Tebbets and Hank Bauer, presently leading the American League with the Baltimore Orioles by eight games. Here's a two-strike pitch. Fouled again off. McCovey's at first, Hunter at second, Wills at short, Santo at third. They are in left, Mays in center, Clemente in right, McCarver now your catcher, and Perry on the mound. National League leads by one game in total all-star victories over the American League. Winners of the seven of the last eight. Onichick waits as Oliva had stepped out. Now Tony's back in and Perry is ready with the pitch. Outside, fastball, ball one, one and two. We were talking about the difficulty of playing Roberto Clemente of the National League Ball Club. Well, his counterpart in the American League is Tony Oliva. Oliva, I should say. Oliva can hit the ball all over, and it seems when he does not get the good part of the bat on the ball, he still has those holes with those bleeders and can just find those holes in the infield. Here's the one-two pitch. Side on and lined to deep center field. Back goes Willie Mays. He's pounding that glove now, and there's the basket catch. High level. If he can do it, but really can. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And the score at the end of the first half of the ninth inning remains the National League one, the American League one.
If you've forgotten how satisfying a real cigarette can taste, then you should smoke Camel. Millions of men do. Tony Kubek along with Jim Simpson here at the All-Star Game, and quite an All-Star Game it is. A real pitching duel. One-to-one is the score. Sonny Siebert presently on the mound for the American League. And he's going to face Henry Aaron, a pretty tough customer, as they all are in this ball game. Well, Tommy Agee has now replaced Al Kaline, the first outfield replacement of the ball game, and Agee of the Chicago White Sox moves into center. Kaline, one for four in the day, has retired. And now we are in the bottom of the ninth inning. Hank Aaron, Willie McCovey, and Ron Santo to face Sonny Siebert, and any one of them could end this ball game with one swing. I pitch from Siebert. Siebert has faced three daughters so far, set them down in order, and now the National League crowd here in St. Louis realizes that the National League can wrap it up and miss the bottom of the ninth. High pitch to Aaron. It is 2-0. and The American League defense is playing Aaron very deep in the outfield, and they're playing him slightly to pull. Brooks Robinson, the third baseman, of course, in a late-inning situation, is protecting that line for a possible double. He's shading Aaron toward that third baseline considerably. Two ball pitch, it's straight up in the air. It may make the seats. Brooks Robinson is over, leaning and looking, and it drops into the stands. And by the way, remember, we have now reached the position with Gaylord Perry and Sonny Siebert that if this ball game does go extra innings, the managers, Walt Alston and Sam Neely, can keep these pitches in as long as they are effective and the heat has not bothered them. The three-inning rule no longer exists. Two balls, one strike to the leadoff batter, Hank Aaron, in the bottom of the ninth. Siebert ready, throws inside and high. It is three and one. One to one to score. McCovey on deck. Then one pitch taking all the way is Aaron, and it's three and two. Fastball at the knees. Talking about the possibility of extra innings, the American League still has Steve Barber, Gary Bell, Jim Catfish, Hunter of Kansas City, and Pete Rickard ready to go if they have to. Three and two. This one is lined to center. Tommy Agee swoops over, hits the glove, just as Willie Mays does. Tommy likes to imitate Willie. He makes the catch and is one down. The National League pitchers that have not been in the ball game are Billy McCool of the Cincinnati Reds, Claude Ramon of the Astros, and Bob Veal of the Pirates. So there's still seven pitchers left that either one of these managers can use if they have to. Now the left-handed slugger, Willie McCovey, with 17 home runs on the year, steps in. Seaman has been very effective so far. Throws high and high, ball one. McCovey asked to see the ball, or else Seaman said he didn't want it. One of the two, Hanachik, makes the change. Santo on deck. One out on the ninth. American League one, National League one. Siebert throws, change up, and it floats over the plate at strike one. One and one. Siebert has a good live arm. He's got a good fastball, keeps it down, and has a real good curveball and slider. He can be a tough pitcher. is popped up in the air in the infield. Brooks Robinson waves away for Dosey. He's standing on the glass and has it. Two down. Now Ron Santo. Infield hit in the fourth inning. His infield hit drove in Woody Mays with the only run of the ball game for the National League. He's reached on a force play and is lined to Brooks Robinson. One to one, remember. A long ball into the seats can end it. Sonny Siebert 
holds the ball in his glove in front of his chest as he gets the sign from catcher Earl Batty. Does not keep the ball behind his back. Just holds it there and then starts his wind-up from there. Third ball outside corner. It's strike one to Santo. In line with this, Jim, about Siebert uh, holding the ball by his chest. Many times a pitcher that has a control problem will do this, cut down his motion a little bit, and it gives him a little bit more control. And I think this is uh, manager Bertie Tebbett's theory in making Siebert do this. Ready for the next pitch. Santo swung a little late on that one, and it's strike two. I think that pitch from Sonny had a little more speed than Santo expected. He's got that easy motion, and by the time you know it, that ball's on you, and you have to be ready off a pitcher like that. Two strike pitch, fastball. This one is too low, and it's one and two. Sounds like the vice president of the United States is on his way to make an airplane, Tony. Looking down in the box, he's no longer there, and Sirens are going. Bounding ball out of his fair. Robinson backhands it and back a third. Makes the long throw on a beauty of a play. And it's no runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. The score at the end of the ninth inning is all tied. The American League won, the National League won. Box seats for today's game are $8, and worth it, because there's always a special excitement to an all-star game. But you know, thousands of folks are enjoying first-rate seats for less than 50 cents. Those are the people watching on Motorola Color Television. You see, Motorola Color Television costs only about 15 cents a viewing hour for a table model you buy on a three-year contract. You get high-fidelity color and the rectangular picture pioneered by Motorola. What's more, Motorola offers solid-state reliability at 17 critical points. If you've never seen baseball telecast in color, well, you've got a new thrill coming. Visit your Motorola dealer Saturday and take a look at the Major League Game of the Week. Brought to you by Motorola. See how you can enjoy color TV for about 15 cents an hour with Motorola. Now introducing the new flight of color television. Well, we've got an extra inning ball game here in the All-Star game. The American League, one run, five hits, no errors. The National League, one run, four hits and no errors. Going into the 10th inning. Gaylord Perry continues on the mound, and Brooks Robinson, who has had quite a ball game for the American League All-Stars, is up. In the second inning, Robinson hit a low liner that skipped past Aaron for triple off Sandy Koufax. Koufax then unleashed a curveball that was a wild pitch, and Brooks scored. In the fifth inning, he grounded a short. In the seventh inning, he singled a left. He's also turned in no less than three fine plays at third base. Gaylord Perry ready, throws the curveball inside. It's ball one. Well, Jim, this is the fourth All-Star game to go into extra innings. In 1950, the game at Chicago went 14 innings. 1955 at Milwaukee, 12 innings. 61 at Frisco, 10 innings. There he throws, and this is fouled out of play. Off to the right. One and one to Brooks Robinson, the Baltimore Orioles. Fine third baseman. There's still some pinch hitters around, you know. Philippe Alou, Tom Haller. for the National League. 1-1, one, one, and Brooks Robinson has another base hit over the head of Maury Wills in the short left field. Robbie makes the big turn at first, but comes back. The ball got over the head of Ron Hunt, but Gaylord Curry backed up and holds Robinson to the single. He is three for four on the day and has the only run scored, plus those fine plays. Now in the seventh inning, Robinson led off with a single, and Norm Cash, the batter now, up for the first time, grounded him to a double play. Norm Cash about to come up again. The American League still has in the dugout, available for pinch hitting, Andy Echeverin and Carl Yastrzemski, to name a couple. And now it'll be interesting to see if Manager Sam Mealy will play the for the one run, which I imagine he will. He may try and advance this runner. Cash tries to bunt, but it's fouled at the plate. Strike one. Now Norm just leans on the bat and takes a good long look at Bertie Tepitz. Remember, they just figured these signs out maybe as late as this morning. He wants to make sure he's got them right. One strike to Norm Cash. Brooks Robinson at first. None out. We are now in the tenth inning. One to one to score. 
Digging in his Santo. Cash. This ball gets away, and there's a free trip to second base. Gaylord Perry to the ball high. Let's see if it's a wild pitch or pass ball. Looked like a wild pitch, but we will await the official decision. There was a possibility there, Jim, that that... It scored as a wild pitch. There's a possibility that that may have been a cross-up by Gaylord Perry. As you mentioned, the signs... That catcher and that pitcher also have to get their signs straight, and it appeared that McCarver was looking for a breaking ball, and he got the fastball up and high, and the ball just got right on by him. But Cash does not have to bunt now. And remember, the only other run the American League got figured with a wild pitch from Koufax. This is outside. To and one the count to Norm Cash. Nobody out in the top of the tenth. Brooks Robinson down at second after a single and a wild pitch. Gaylord Perry throwing to his catcher, Tim McCarver. The batter is Norm Cash. And Cash is a pull hitter, and he'll be trying to pull that ball on the ground. Ball is hit straight up in the air. Willie Mays in short center field. Taps that glove and has it, and Brooks Robinson bluffs the bunt. The play to third, and Mays lines a stop right to Sato standing on third base. Needless to say... Robinson went back to second. Here is Earl Batty, the second American League catcher in this ball game. He struck out his first time up in the seventh inning. At that time, he was facing Juan Marichal. Batty with a chance for the RBI. Michelle, or rather Perry, throws, and it's ball one. And now Maury Wills comes over to say something to Gaylord Perry on the mound. I imagine Jim Wills is coming in to talk to Perry to find out exactly how he's going to try to pitch Batty. Batty, of course, does not go one way with his hits. He can spray the ball on the right field line as well as the left, and Wills wants to know how you're going to pitch him, Gaylord. I want to know, should I play him in the hole or should I play him through the middle? One ball, no strikes to Batty. There he throws, and this is fouled off to the right. One and two. Perry is not overpowering. He uh, moves the ball around quite a bit. He has a real good slider and a sinker ball, and he gets those right-handed hitters leaning over the plate looking for the slider on the outside corner and busts them inside, comes sidearm occasionally to right-handed hitters. He has a fine 12-1 record at this time. One and one the count as Perry stares in. Now has the sign, the stretch. He looks back at Brooks Robinson at second and throws low. Ball two. 49,936 paid here today in better than 100 degree temperatures. Expected to reach 108 today. It was 100 at game time, 1 o'clock this afternoon, St. Louis time. Two and one the count to batting. Tenth inning, one to one the score. Perry throws, and there's a ball. It could be trouble if it drops, but it'll drop foul. Almost made it into the stands down the right field line. McCool is warming up, and so is Regan for the National League. Billy McCool and Phil Regan. Two and two now, the count to batting. One out. One to one the score, two and two the count. Tenth inning. Perry's ready to throw and throws high. It is three and two. It has worked all the way. On deck is Bobby Richardson. And it is not an exaggeration to say that these players are really finding that heat nearly unbearable. Perry at that time just put his hands on his hips and breathed deeply. Here's the pitch, and Batty accidentally fouls it. Picked up in the first base coaching box by Hank Bauer, who keeps it in play. Earl was ducking away from the pitch. It'd be interesting to see if Sam Mealy should try to make a move now. He has no other defensive infielders to put in the ball game should he elect to use a pinch hitter for one of the infielders. So he pretty much has to go along with the infielders hitting for themselves. 
There he's ready and throws inside. It's ball four. Batty walks. Been on first and second with one down in the tenth inning and Bobby Richardson due up. Now Richardson is batting in the number eight spot, but remember, it is for Gossi, who is batting in the number nine spot, not the pitcher. And with this, Walt Alston comes out, and that is the first appearance today by either manager. Tim McCarver goes out, Alston comes over, and it may be that Alston Tony is going to his bullpen, then on first and second, and Richardson do up. And Richardson is going down right now to talk to Bertie Tebbets. Bertie beckoned him down there and wants to tell him to get a good pitch to hit, not to be too anxious up there. Try and get a ball that he can hit to the outfield. Stay out of a double play situation if possible. Well, this is a ballpark of conferences now. There's a big conference on the mound. Two of the umpires, Onichick and Barlick, are talking things over. Bauer is talking to Batty on first base. And Brooks Robinson is talking to Murray Wills, the shortstop, as they stand down at second base. But now Walt Austin comes back. Gaylord Perry remains in the game. And Bobby Richardson, after a talk himself with Bertie Tebbets, the coach at third, steps into the batter's box. Conversation's over. Bobby Richardson steps in against Gaylord Perry. Brooks Robinson at second. Earl Batty at first. One out in a one-to-one ball game in the tenth inning. Perry is ready and throws, and Richardson swings and misses. Strike one. Bobby has been at bat one time thus far this game. He pinch hit for Bobby Knopp in the seventh inning and grounded out to the shortstop. There's a ball hit high. If it stays in play, McCovey will have a shot at it down the right field line. Foul, and he reaches into the stands and makes the catch. Brooks Robinson blocks for third, but goes back to second. There are two down. And just one thing made that catch possible for Willie McCovey, and that's his big six foot six inch frame with those long arms, and he re- reached about three rolls in and pulled it back out. Well, with men on first and second now, Jim Fergosi, who lined to Panetti in right, is the batter. Two down in the tenth. Ball game that took two hours and five minutes to play the first nine innings is now stretched to the tenth. Gaylord Perry is ready and throws, and this one is around the letters. Strike one. Perry with a sign from McCarver, looking back at Brooks Robinson, now looks in and throws, and a swing and a miss by Fergosi. It's strike two. And I imagine, Jim, that everything on those, I know about everything that's on those infielders' mind, they want to knock any ball down that they can't make a clean play on. They're going to be diving for that ball or what have you to try and stop it from going into the outfield and scoring that winning run. Well, Perry can afford to waste a few, and Fergosi must guard the plate outside and high from Gaylord. It is one and two. A 1966 All-Star Baseball game being brought to you on NBC Radio, and remember the World Series this fall. Television cameras have been draped around here in wet towels to keep them cool. Fergosi swings and misses, and that's off. In the tenth. No one. One hit, no errors, and two men left. And at the end of the first half of the tenth inning, the score remains the National League one and the American League one. Men, I want to warn you about a new razor blade. That's right, warn you, because this new blade is so good, if you try it just once, you're going to become spoiled. So spoiled that you'll probably never go back to the blades in your medicine chest. This new blade is the Gillette Super Stainless, also known as the Spoiler. It is a miracle plastic coating baked onto the edge. Stay with it just once, and you can actually feel how much less cold there is. Ask for the spoiler, alias for the Gillette Super Stainless. And after that great Gillette Super Stainless shave, see what happens when you put on Sun Up Aftershave, the robust refresher from Gillette. Put a little Sun Up on your face, and you'll pound your chest with vigor. Splash on a handful of Sun Up, and you'll give the mating call of the Bull 8. 
two handfuls of sun up, and you might try to swing to work on a vine. Try the robust refresher from Gillette. Try sun up. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. WGY Schenectady, the Carl W. List truckload sale is on with the biggest bargains ever offered in the 38-year history of Carl W. List. Special hours are in effect July 14th only, open until 9 p.m. Don't miss out on these bargains. Here are just a few. GE Disposal, only $27.04. 4,000 BTU GE air conditioners, only $99. And GE full-sized wall ovens, only $78.14. Many are one of a kind, so it's first come, first served. Don't miss this Bargain Hunters truckload sale at Carl W. Miss, 136 Erie Boulevard, Schenectady. And nothing could make these St. Louis fans happier than having McCarver break this ball game up in the new ballpark right here in St. Louis. McCarver came in defensively in the top of the eighth inning after Joe Torrey had batted three times, failing to hit. McCarver, left-handed batter, will face the new pitcher for the American League All-Stars, Pete Rickard. Sonny Siebert, who has retired, worked two innings, gave up no runs, no hits, no errors. He sent everybody down in order. Here's McCarver and Washington's Pete Rickard. Now the pitcher throws. One ball, base hit to right field. McCarver gets the base hit. Picked up there by Oliva. McCarver makes the turn and comes back. And now Ron Hunt is the batter. And Hunt is a pretty good man with the bat. And in the bottom of the 10th inning, it is highly likely that the National League will try to move McCarver into scoring position with a bunt. One to one to score, none out with McCarver first in the bottom of the 10th of the 1966 All-Star Baseball game. Mari Wills is on deck, and this will be Mari's first time at bat. Now listen to the National Leaguers here in St. Louis. Rickard throws, bumps right back to Rickard. He will go to first after looking at second. The sacrifice bonus complete. McCarver is safe at second. And now we have the same situation for the National League Club as we did for the American League. And let's see if Maury Wills can drive in that winning run. Coming out of the National League dugout now, not to pinch it for Marty Wills, but to pinch it for the number nine hitter will be Felipe Alou of the Atlanta Braves. Of course, the base set right here, Jim, and he may not have to hit. Well, Marty Wills is hitting 292, and Marty is one of the few switch hitters in this all-star game, and Zor is batting right. The conference at second, one down, record throwing, and it's low with the fastball. And record and Wills used to be on the same team, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Record printed from Los Angeles to Washington. Along with Frank Howard, Ken McMullen, Bill Ortega. Round ball, foul, down the third baseline. The American League outfield is playing Maury Wills very shallow. Frank Robinson in left, Tommy Agee in center. And Tony Oliva on right field, and they all three have very fine throwing arms, so it'll be interesting to see on a base hit to the outfield how close that plate could possibly be at home plate. One and one to count to Wills. Rickard Reddy throws a fastball, and Murray was attempting to bunt there. And fouled it at the plate. It's one and two. Brooks Robinson is not playing Maury Wills very closely at third base. He's not playing him in on the grass as most third basemen do play Maury Wills. He feels that Wills will try and drive that runner. Here's the pitch. And there's the line drive over the head. Oliva will come up with it. He's got a good arm. Here comes McCarver. The play is at the plate. McCarver will score. The game is over.
line drive to right field by Molly Wills. Oliva came up with the ball. McCarver was off and running with the pitch and the hit. Oliva fired the body at home, but McCarver beat the play by two or three steps. And the National League is won by the score of two to one. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap up today's ball game. The final score of the National League two, the American League one. Car races all over the country. Winner of the Daytona 500, the Rockingham 500, the Atlanta 500, Plymouth, winner of the Darlington 400, the Yankee 300 at Indianapolis, and the grueling Charlotte 600. Of course, you can't buy these race cars at your Plymouth dealer. They are specially modified just for stock car racing. But the same engineering know-how that gives the racing Emmy such a record of performance and reliability goes into every Plymouth you can buy at your Plymouth dealer. Why with the winner? Plymouth. A great car by Chrysler Corporation. Tony Kubek and Jim Simpson here in the National League has won the All-Star Game in the 10th inning, 2-1 by virtue of Maury Wills' line single in right field. Brooks Robinson has been voted unanimous, unanimously as the most valuable player in this ball game. He made three fine plays at third base. And, of course, he had a couple of base hits that almost were very important for the American League. And, of course, the story is Maury Wills, Tim McCarver, of course, led off the game, led off the 10th inning with a base hit to right field. This made the St. Louis Cardinal fans very happy. The American League had the opportunity in the first of the 10th, one up, man on second base in scoring position, but could not get him home. And now here's Jim Simpson with a little more. All right, Tony, the American League scored first. That was in the second inning when a line driver, Brooks Robinson, skipped by Hank Aaron for a triple. Sandy Koufax on the man at that time committed a wild pitch, and Robinson scored the only run for the American League. In the fourth inning, the National League tied it up. Willie Mays got a single, and on Clemente's single, advanced to second base. With two out, Long Santo and Mays now at third, bounced a little ball that Robinson could not handle. It was a base hit, and Mays scored from third base. And that was the one-to-one -one ball game, and that's exactly the way it stayed until the 10th inning. In the 10th inning, the American League had a chance as Brooks Robinson led off with a single, his third hit of the ball game, went to second on a wild pitch, and with one out, Earl Batty walked. But then Gaylord Perry, the winning pitcher, got Bobby Richardson to foul out, and he struck out Jim Fergosi. The winning pitcher, of course, is Gaylord Perry. Gaylord Perry, the winner, and Pete Richards, the loser. Two runs on six hits and no errors for the National League. One run, six hits, and no errors for the American League. In the overall standings, the National League has now won 19 All-Star games. The American League, 17, has been one tie. The National League has now won eight of the last nine All-Star games and 15 of the last 20. To repeat also, it has been very hot. The temperature game time to the 1966 All-Star game was 100 degrees. It was expected to climb as high as 108 officially, and I'm sure it was at least that on the ball field today. The entire ball game, Tony, took less than two and a half hours for a ball game that went 10 innings. And another thrilling contest for the All-Star. This broadcast was authorized on the broadcast rights granted by the Commissioner of Baseball solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. In any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Our producer today was Len Dillon. Our engineer from KSC St. Louis was John Olsey. Now, this is Jim Simpson with Tony Kubek saying goodbye from St. Louis. That wraps up the 1966 All-Star Baseball game. Be with us again on October the 5th for the first game of the 1966 World Series. When your host as today, again will be Chrysler Corporation, makers of Plymouth, Dodge, Chrysler, Imperial, and Dodge Trucks. Gillette, heads up, works like water, only better. Take the pledge, use heads up. Camel Cigarettes, you'll find Camel's real taste satisfies longer. And by Falstaff Brewing Corporation of St. Louis, brewers of premium quality beer. 
The final score once again in the 37th All-Star Game is National League 2, American League 1. This has been an NBC Radio Network production. This is the NBC Radio Network.